name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, today is June 24th, 2021. It's currently 9.32, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, I've got a few administrative details uh, before we move to the agenda. Uh, first, um, as I mentioned last week, the governor lifted the emergency order. Um, we're going to continue to hold these virtual meetings, um, which you know we all feel increases the accessibility of the board. But um, now we are also going to be present in a physical space um, with at least one board member present uh, um, for the near future. And so today, Kyle um, and Nellie uh, are coming to you um, from the second floor conference room in the Agency of Agriculture in Montpelier. So if anyone would like to meet Kyle in person, um, you know, he'll, he and Nellie will be there until about 2 p.m. today. And uh, just a huge thank you to Secretary Tebitz um, and his staff for their hospitality and joining us, or hosting us, sorry. Um, in related news, uh, the board officially has an office space. Um, I don't think we have any furniture quite yet, um, but we will be located at 12 Baldwin Street in Montpelier. Um, so thank you very much to uh, BGS Commissioner Fitch and Mark O'Grady and to all of your staff um, for your help in standing up our board. Um, we also have uh, a new job posted for the board. Um, we're seeking an administrative services manager, essentially a business manager for the board that will oversee our budgeting, our fiscal processes. Um, it will develop our organizational structures as we grow. Um, it will collaborate with kind of our partner agencies and um, just generally manage all of our administrative functions. So the job description is currently posted through the state's HR website. It's posted on LinkedIn, Facebook, jobsinvermont.com. It'll be on our website shortly, and um, we are going to be doing some print advertising and some other advertising strategies. Um, so if you know, if you're interested, or if you have anyone interested in that position, please forward it along, and we encourage um, anyone to apply. So again, uh, as I mentioned last week, um, we are going to continue to hold special meetings but on a regular schedule until we formally adopt a regular meeting schedule. We started um, to put pen to paper onto what that could look like, and we'll likely adopt uh, something um, as soon as our executive director officially starts. And so with the exception of next week, when we are going to be taking a week off of public meetings, um, we're going to continue to meet at this rough time frame Thursdays, 9.30 to about 2 p.m. Um, we recognize uh, as a board that this is not ideal for everyone, um, given the demands on people's time during the workday. Um, but our regular meeting schedule will likely include some after hour meetings to include uh, to increase public participation. So moving um, to the agenda, um, we're continuing our work um, to hold meetings dedicated to the priorities that we've identified in Act 164 and Act 62. Um, last week, we heard uh, some very compelling testimony about how the board should be thinking about social equity and agricultural equity, economic equity, um, as well as uh, we heard from some national experts that really helped orient us to what's been working in other states, what has not been very successful, and how we should be thinking about supporting equity in this industry. Um, today, uh, we're going to be focused on the Vermont Medical Use Program. This is an issue of particular importance to the board who will be taking over the medical program on January 1st, 2022. Um, I would like to acknowledge that there is a tremendous amount of anxiety about um, continuity of services and products for patients during this transition, as well as uh, when the current dispensaries are allowed to enter the adult use market. Um, I've been working with the head of the medical program and um, with the commissioner's office at DPS to ensure that this transition will be seamless. Um, and 
you know, I actually would like to think that this is a incredible opportunity for us to reimagine um, or to refresh the medical program. So today um, we're going to hear from representatives from the dispensaries, including Meg Delia, who will be serving on our advisory panel. And they're going to be talking about some of the history of the medical program in Vermont, some of the current challenges um, that they are facing. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge all the incredible work that the dispensaries have done over the past decade or so. Um, you at great personal and financial risk to themselves. Um, and um, I've always really been impressed with their commitment to patients, um, their advocacy uh, to increase access, to reduce costs. And, um, you know, over the last, I don't know how many years, I've consistently heard from them that their business model is not exactly profitable. And that gives me some concern as we think about the long-term viability of the medical program. On the flip side, um, I've consistently heard from um, Vermonters, patients, caregivers, that the dispensaries are not affordable. Um, and that given the you know, limited number of them um, and their kind of geographic locations, that they're not particularly accessible. So we're going to hear from patients, um, patient advocates, caregivers um, about some of the challenges that they're facing and how we might be able to develop a more patient centric program. Um, finally, um, we're going to hear from the chair uh, of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, as well as the Vermont Medical Association appointee to that committee. Um, this is a group that's been tasked with making recommendations to improve the quality and accessibility of the medical program. Um, they've been given a new task for the immediate future to kind of reimagine what the board should look like and to be a conduit um, really for the voices of patients and caregivers. Uh, and they've been given a seat on our advisory board. So I apologize for the long introduction, um, but I really think that this is an important moment um, for the Vermont medical program. Um, you know, I've seen over the years some resistance to making wholesale changes to the program. However, with the kind of advent of adult use retail cannabis looming, um, this is actually the perfect time to rethink the program, see, think about what's working, what needs improvement, um, and, and fundamentally um, how we as a board should create a patient-centric system that's high quality, affordable, and accessible. So these, um, I just repeat something that I said last week, these initial conversations are really um, to orient the board at a very high level um, to some of the priorities that are in Act 164 and, once, and 62. I've spoken with a number of patients and caregivers um, that could not join us today, but would like to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, so our plan is to do extensive stakeholder engagement um, with our advisory uh, panel, with our advisory subcommittees, and with the public um, once we have those entities in place and we have our executive director in place. Um, but, you know, if anyone uh, listening uh, would like to reach out to us, we have um, kind of an online portal um, to submit comments to the board, um, and we will continue to hold these public meetings. So please feel free to reach out to us uh, in any, any way you can. Um, I'd like to move now to the agenda. We're a little bit behind schedule. Um, we have a few issues uh, that we need to do, approval of minutes. So our draft minutes are posted on our on our website. Um, I'd like to just uh, ask for a motion to approve the minutes from uh, 6 17 21. I move to approve the minutes from 6 17 21. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, okay. And now we have also on our agenda, we have to approve our organizational structure. Um, Nellie, if it's not too difficult, would you mind just pulling it up on the screen briefly? We're on it. Give us 20 seconds. So our organizational structure, um, we have, um, I think, 
where we, we will eventually have, when we uh, assume the medical program, 10 employees. And um, this is an organizational structure that we kind of worked out um, that, uh, you know, has the executive director kind of at the top of the chart um, answering to the board and then kind of a, a pyramid of uh, beneath that. Um, looks like it's coming up now. Okay. So this seems to make the most sense to me. Um, so I would uh, entertain a motion to approve uh, this organizational chart. Um, I, I don't know if it has necessarily a title, but. Um, so I will move to approve the organizational chart as presented for the Cannabis Control Board. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so, or aye, sorry. Uh, the. Um, that's it for the kind of administrative aspects of our agenda. I would like to move to the witnesses just because we're running a little bit behind schedule, but uh, Julie and Kyle, would you like to make any uh, kind of opening remarks before we do that? Uh, no, I'll, I would like to start hearing from the witnesses, I think. Likewise, I think you covered it in your initial remarks, Mr. Chairman, so thank Great. you. Great, okay, well, do we have, Vir yes, we do, Virginia um, and Meg. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of telling folks who you are and then get into um, the, you know, your testimony. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. And I also want to thank the board for having a day focused on uh, the medical program, which I truly believe is a important uh, program for many Vermonters. Um, I'm Virginia Renfrew. Uh, I'm with Sats and Renfrew Consulting. Um, I don't know, do you want Meg to in introduce herself before I get going, Chair, or? Uh, sure, that'd be great, just so everyone knows who's on the screen. Okay. Good morning, my name is Meg Delia. Uh, I have been an employee of Series Med, previously Champlain Valley Dispensary for almost four years now. I also serve as a representative of the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association. Thank you. So um, just to, I'm going to kind of do an overview, the historical overview of the medical program. Um, so in 1998, uh, Gail Zatz and myself started Zatz and Renfrew Consulting. And one of our first clients was the AIDS service organizations and people living with AIDS. And what I kept hearing from the coalition, uh, people living with AIDS, was that they really wanted to be able to use cannabis legally, that um, they found that it relieved uh, the symptoms from the disease and also from the medication that they took. And they lived in fear of being arrested and sent to jail because of this use. So in 2000, there was a bill that was introduced in the House, uh, the first uh, cannabis, uh, medical cannabis bill. And um, we found that we actually had support from all three parties. And uh, this was not in any way a partisan issue. So we were successful in getting it out of the House, and then it went to the Senate. And unfortunately, we, uh, we failed in the Senate. But what we did get out of the Senate was uh, to form a task force to look at the issue and then report back to the legislature. And on that task force, there was no legislators on the task force. It was made up of patients, caregivers, uh, healthcare professionals, and law enforcement. And there was some uh, very lively uh, discussions and debates that went on around that, uh, on that task force. And um, the majority of the task force supported moving forward with uh, a law that would protect patients from uh, using cannabis. So in 2002, Senator uh, Dick Sears introduced a bill uh, that, um, would allow this, uh, allow medical marijuana. Um, and that bill had a broad range of qualifying conditions 
it allowed a patient to have up to seven plants and it had the registry in the Department of Health. The bill passed the Senate and when it went to the House, they narrowed that bill and they decided that only patients with HIV, MS and cancer would be part of the registry and that they could have two immature plants and one mature plant. And they also put the registry with the Department of Public Safety. Now, the reason they did that was because the Department of Health came in opposing the bill and also saying that they would have nothing to do with the registry. Now, both bills allowed uh, a, a registry patient to buy from the illicit market uh, and, and not be charged uh, as long as they didn't have more than an ounce on them. So that bill did pass uh, both bodies and it went to Governor Douglas and he allowed it to become law, but he didn't sign it. And at the time he made the comment, I cannot actively support a measure that allows Vermonters to be subject to prosecution under federal law, increasing the availability of a controlled substance and sends a dangerous message to our children. The law was the most restrictive one in the country, and unfortunately, it still is today. In 2006, there were 30 registered patients and five caregivers. In 2007, patients went to the legislature asking to have chronic pain added as a qualifying condition. And because of their testimony, the legislature supported that. And so chronic pain was added. And they also increased the number of plants to seven immature and to two mature. In 2009, there were 219 patients and 42 caregivers. What I kept hearing from patients was that they wanted to be able to go somewhere to actually buy their cannabis. And they didn't want to be out on the streets buying it. Many of them had tried to grow it. They had failed. Some lived in uh, housing where they were unable to grow it uh, because they were renting. So um, they basically wanted to have dispensaries. And at that time, Dep the Department of Public Safety did a survey of the patients and the majority of those patients wanted to have dispensaries. So in 2011, Senator Sears and Senator White introduced a bill that would allow four uh, medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, one condition to that program was that it had to be self-sufficient and not dependent on the general fund. So the, the bill passed uh, and the governor signed it into law and there was a $2,500 non-refundable um, fee for applying for a license. And then when a license was issued, there was a $20,000 fee for the first year of operation. And then after that, it's $25,000 a year. And this program has never used any general funds to fund it. It has been funded through the dispensaries, the patients and the caregivers. And I think as you have heard, that program has run, um, uh, you know, has had more money than they need to run that program. And um, unfortunately, a few years ago, there was about $300,000 that was taken out of that fund to put into the general fund. And um, <laughs> that definitely uh, caused quite a outrage, but there, there was really nothing that we could do about that because um, special funds can definitely be dipped into uh, by the administration. So DPS put together a group to uh, review the applications that came in for the dispensaries. And that um, group consisted of patients, caregivers, and law enforcement. In 2013, three dispensaries opened. In 2012, there were 648 patients. In 2014, that number had doubled. When the dispensaries opened, patients could choose to either grow their own or go to a dispensary. They could not do both. I think it's important to note 
that when the bill was moving through the legislature, the Department of Justice sent a letter to the governor stating that the federal government could come in at any time and seize the properties of the dispensaries. Vermont chose to move forward with the bill, but there were so many unknowns for those that were applying for these licenses. The IRS didn't recognize them as a nonprofit, only the state did. No banks would handle their money, so it was cash only. And, you know, certainly as a nonprofit, um, you know, normally you would file for a 501c3, but because they were not recognized, uh, they, they never were able to get that status. At the end of 2014, uh, the dispensaries formed the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. And uh, in 2015, Zatz and Renfrew uh, started to represent them in the Vermont legislature. Since 2015, there's been some changes to the law. Uh, they have added delivery. They expanded the definition of healthcare professional to include uh, licensed naturopath physicians. They decreased the length of the bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship from six months to three months. And they removed the three month requirement for patients with terminal illness cancer, AIDS, or currently under hospice care. In adding to the qualifying conditions, glaucoma, Crohn's disease, Parkinson's disease, and PTSD. And they also allowed an individual, um, I'm sorry, allowing uh, a minor to have two caregivers. Uh, anyone over the age of 21 has to have, uh, can only have one. Um, when they added the PTSD, uh, that, that was a big battle, uh, and uh, there was a patient who came in and gave incredible testimony. Uh, he had been in uh, the Iraq war and uh, suffered from uh, chronic back pain uh, due to uh, a wound and then also from his PTSD. And Unfortunately, if you look at the law, you'll see that it's only someone who uh, has a qualifying condition of PTSD that has to go both to a medical doctor into a mental health professional. Two forms have to be signed for those people. And so I would ask, uh, I know that Meg is going to be talking about different things, but um, I, I think that's something that we should think about of why are we treating a mental illness uh, differently uh, if we're trying to talk about the over health, overall health of an individual. Um, they removed the requirement that a patient's application be notarized, and they allowed patients to both cultivate at home and purchase from a licensed dispensary, and removed the requirement that patients have a locked container to transfer their can cannabis purchases. So in 2018, Vermont legalized cannabis and allowed anyone over the age of 21 to grow two mature plants and possess one ounce. Since the law took effect, we have seen the number of patients decrease. Previous, previously, before it was enacted, the program was growing each year. We knew that there were approximately 500 patients on the registry uh, who only grew. That's the only reason that they were on the registry. They didn't use the dispensaries. So we knew that once this law passed that those 500 people would drop off because why would you want to, you know, pay a fee, have to go see your doctor every year. So we anticipated that. Um, what we didn't really anticipate was how the illicit market really exploded in Vermont. And today you can buy anything out there. If you want to get edibles, if you want to get a vape pen, you know, you name it, it's out there. And I really believe that, you know, there are people out there who are uh, buying from the illicit market who are using it medically. But because we have so many hoops people have to jump through to get into this program, it's easier for them just to get it off the streets. And um, 
I think what we have to think about is what harm is being caused to those individuals when they're buying from someone who is not making sure that that product is a safe product. I want to close with saying that I am very excited that this program is moving under the Cannabis Control Board. I think that um, in order for this program to remain viable, it needs support from those that are overseeing it. And so I, I truly welcome this move. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I've got some questions that are probably specific to you, but I think it makes sense for us to hear from Meg first and then mm -hmm. ask questions um, to the both of you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Great, thanks. So Meg, th and thank you, Meg, for your willingness to join our advisory committee. Um, well, uh, the committee has a few names um, or a few members that have yet to be named, but we'll We'll start um, kind of an orientation with the advisory committee somewhat soon. Great. Well, thank you. I look forward to it. And uh, thank you for having me here today. As Virginia mentioned, the medical program, of course, is foundational in Vermont's cannabis industry. However, for the dispensaries, uh, providing that service to the people of Vermont has absolutely had its challenges. As states across the country have expanded their medical programs, uh, Vermont's really has remained frozen in time with far too many barriers to access, resulting in a decreasing patient base and potentially an unsustainable program. Now that cannabis is legal in the state of Vermont and has been since 2018, it just doesn't make sense to keep having such a restrictive program. The 2018 legalization of cannabis had a significant impact on the medical program, as Virginia stated. We lost about 500 people um, who left the program because they no longer had to be registered to grow. We also, of course, saw the illicit market explode with product. With the restrictive nature of the program and the robust illicit market, the medical program has drastically declined. Simply put, it is easier for Vermonters to grow at home or purchase from the illicit market than it is to sign up with the Vermont Marijuana Registry. Moving forward, we would like to see the program grow to incorporate 2 to 3% of Vermont's population. But to do this, we really need to address the barriers to accessing the program. Medical patients are constantly confronted with significant barriers to access, including a lack of knowledge about the program, limited qualifying conditions as determined by the state rather than by healthcare professionals, only being allowed to shop at the patient's designated dispensary, an annual renewal process that is time consuming and costly to the patient, a three month waiting period after the first visit with a uh, healthcare provider and having to wait for that healthcare provider to sign the application and being limited to the amount of cannabis they can purchase in 30 days. And lastly, there is, of course, the cost of the medical cannabis. While there's little the dispensaries can do to increase access via the program, we can offer financial assistance. Series Med, for example, offers discounts to veterans and to those who qualify for the Three Squares program. Those who utilize the financial um, assistance make up almost 10% of the patients registered with Series Med. As Virginia outlined, VCTA has been fighting for years to make the program more accessible and inclusive. With the introduction of S-117 by Senator Sears, we had hoped to see significant changes made to the program, but the bill was never taken up in the House. These amendments include removing the three-month treating or consulting relationship requirement so that patients are not delayed in obtaining medical cannabis, allowing healthcare providers to determine what medical diseases and conditions qualify a patient to participate in the program. Um, not only would this increase access, but it could potentially have a positive impact on the opioid epidemic in Vermont. Policymakers in Colorado, Illinois, and New York now allow for healthcare providers to recommend medical cannabis instead of potentially addictive and deadly opioids. We are losing people at a staggering rate to opioids in Vermont and why not embrace the safer alternative? 
Also included in those amendments introduced by S-117 was removing the requirement that a patient must designate a single dispensary as the one they will shop at rather than utilizing the services of any medical dispensary in the state. Increasing the possession limit to three mature plants and the purchase of three ounces per month. Um, and allowing for reciprocity. Vermont is home to many snowbirds and attracts millions of tourists a year, some of whom possess medical cards and could potentially support our program. In addition, we would also like to see removing the fingerprinting requirement for caregivers as added by S54, increasing access via public transport by reconsidering geographic location restrictions. And of course, uh, in, in order to increase social equity, we would like to see a reevaluation of background checks for employees. Uh, we do understand the importance of them, but for example, uh, recently we had an employee of Series Med who was initially given a card. Uh, a year later, upon his renewal application, was actually denied that card due to a nonviolent drug offense that had occurred years prior. Because of that, we worked with DPS as well as um, his lawyers while he was on first PTO and then unemployment for about six weeks uh, while we uh, had that removed from his record so that we could resubmit that application to DPS. Unfortunately, we see that more often than we would like and we would like to provide these employment opportunities for people, especially with nonviolent drug offenses, um, potentially years old. You know, we re really want to see these situations evaluated on an individual basis. The people of Vermont really need the medical program. The medical dispensaries provide a variety of products that won't be offered in the adult use program with higher concentrations of THC and, of course, without tax. Not only are the products a necessity for those in the program, but so is the service that the medical dispensaries provide. The dispensaries ensure that patients have access to knowledgeable and compassionate staff who are available should the patient need assistance. They also ensure that patients aren't waiting in long lines or being rushed through the purchasing process. Ultimately, consumer safety is our priority. We have and continue to be supportive of lab testing. Series Med started their own lab to ensure the products are safe and have the anticipated cannabinoid profile. The lab is ISO and Emerald certified so that patients can be assured that the products are of the highest quality. We have never opposed third-party testing. It just hasn't been available. We recently have identified a local third party lab and are working with them to understand what that process will look like, as well as to expand our testing capabilities. However, we are concerned that with only one third party lab in Vermont, there will be a bottleneck with the rollout of adult use. It is our hope that moving away from the Department of Public Safety and to the Cannabis Control Board will create positive change for the program. This industry is constantly changing, and we look forward to having a regulatory body that is focused on that evolving industry and can provide the support to both medical dispensary operators and patients. Along with moving the medical program to the CCB, the medical dispensaries look forward to participating in the adult use program. Ultimately, prices of medical cannabis are high due to the regulatory burden that has been placed on the medical dispensaries. To continue serving the medical patient base and to lower prices, participating in the adult use market is the only option. Our experiences have given us a preview of what this market can be like, and we want all future operators to succeed. So we hope that the challenges we have faced uh, will help construct a successful and inclusive both medical and adult use market. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, Virginia. I have a few questions, but I, I'd like to defer our first to Kyle and Julie. Go ahead, Julie, if you have any. I do. Um, in, in thinking about the cost that um, patients pay each time they go to the dispensary, is there any movement in other states that have medical cannabis for like a localized insurance cover coverage, either like a capitated benefit or 
a captive benefit or something like that that patients can access. And I realize it would have to be on the state level, right? That it would not be able to be a federal or a national insurance company. I am not aware of that happening in any state. Um, I would be curious to know if perhaps some health savings accounts would cover that, you know, if there's a facet of the insurance that could cover it, but none that I'm aware of at the moment. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that that's definitely been an issue of, you know, <clears throat> trying to figure out a way to um, have insurance cover this cost as it does for any other uh, prescription drug that someone is getting. But uh, as you say, it would have to be on the state level. Uh, and I think trying to add that, uh, you know, we've talked about having legislation on that, but uh, I think it would be a really uphill battle of trying to add that. Hi, Meg. Um, good to see you again. Um, just, just for my notes, would you remind me which states allow um, cannabis to be prescribed um, in lieu of an opioid? I think you mentioned like four states, but I just couldn't write fast enough. No problem. Um, Colorado, New York, and Illinois. And I would imagine, well, I guess I shouldn't make any assumptions. So, so, so when it comes to a healthcare provider prescribing um, cannabis versus, you know, certain uh, mental or physical ailments um, that have been identified through the legis or the legislative or statutory process, um, how do I guess those states, if you're aware, um, you know, treat that? How much discretion would they have in generally prescribing cannabis? And what what are other states doing? Um, you know, what's the What's the overview of of how much flexibility a healthcare provider has in other states that might not have these strictly, you know, identified physical or mental ailments through statute? If that makes sense, hopefully it does. I I think so, and let me know if I don't answer your question completely. Um, so my understanding is that it ranges. You have some states that have very specific conditions that qualify a patient for the program, and then there are other states that have implemented these kind of blanket statements that ultimately allow the healthcare provider to determine what condition they feel qualifies. Thank you, Virginia, feel free to feel free to jump in if you have any. any yeah, comments. I think I think that I'm trying to remember right now. Um, I think there's a couple of states where it actually lets the uh, healthcare uh, provider decide. Um, but when we look at other states with their medical in the qualifying conditions, it's a very long list. And in Vermont, we have such a short list. And, you know, when you think about like anxiety, you know, how many people, especially over this last year and a half, were going to their doctors to get something to help them with their anxiety. And this would have been a perfect time for people to think about using uh, cannabis instead of getting on to, uh, you know, um, Xanax or something like that, which is so hard to get yourself off of. Um, so um, having that, you know, ha having that ability, again, I think that you go to the doctor and, uh, or you go to your healthcare professional um, and, um, you know, they make a decision of what, what's going on with you and if they're gonna prescribe something to you. And again, I think it's always important to remember that a uh, healthcare professional um, in Vermont, they are not prescribing. They are only uh, recon recommending. So they sign this form saying that this individual has this condition and that uh, you know, cannabis may or may, may help them. Um, but we really, excuse me. No, I just said thank you for that point of clarification on the prescribing versus recommending. Yeah. Um, great. You know, I think there's a lot of changes that <laughs> that that um, that need to be made. It, it sounds like um, I can totally understand how the integrity of the medical program may be you know, thought of in a way to keep it pretty pretty tight, I guess. But it's as you both alluded to, and nothing's really been updated in what seems like a decade. And we all know our society has moved in a certain direction. One more question, and then I think unless 
I know Pepper has questions. Um, talk to me about reciprocity. Um, how are other states and other jurisdictions treating reciprocity? I'm sure just like with my last question, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, I believe predominantly they are allowing for reciprocity. So if you go to another state and you have a medical card, they will serve you. Okay. So I know that, uh, so Maine has that. And uh, I know just hearing from patients that, you know, going up there for, you know, a few weeks and uh, not feeling comfortable going into another state with their uh, products from Vermont, um, that they just go to the, uh, and of course now Maine has retail, but if you go to the Maine um, medical program, uh, they look at your card and then they give you one of their cards. And then um, again, you're not paying the tax and you're getting you know, a, a wider variety. But I do believe that uh, most states um, that have uh, medical programs are now allowing. Great, state. thank you. I got more questions, but I'll stop. I'll stop there for the sake of time. Thank you both. <clears throat> I have one more, sort of on that same train of thought. In Maine, I just happened to have been there last weekend myself. I noticed that there were, you know, medical stores and then, uh, you know, adult use retail stores. Are medical patients able to purchase from either in Maine, do you know, or do they have to only go to a medical store with a medical card? I mean, they can go to either, uh, but the difference is, is that if they go to the medical, they're not paying a tax. So they're not, they couldn't go to the retail store and, and have a tax exempt form, for example. With I don't believe, I don't believe so, but I actually, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Virginia, um, I'd love to just tap into your kind of historical expertise on this and just hear um, from your perspective, just what are the, either the qualifying conditions or some of the restrictions around entry to the medical program that have received the most resistance in the legislature? Um, and you don't have to name any names or name any committees, but just kind of think about, um, you know, I remember acute pain always being kind of a political football in the legislature, but I'm wondering what other, you know, you, you listed a number of restrictions, including reciprocity with other states that kind of need to get a continuous annual approval from your uh, physician um, to uh, maintain your, your patient status. I mean, what are the things that have you seen that have just been kind of not, the legislature's not been willing to discuss? Well, I would definitely say that uh, any condition that might be considered mental health, so whether that's anxiety um, or anything under that, we have totally hit a, hit a wall on that. And, and really the only reason we got the PTSD is I believe is that the young, young man who came in and testified, he was so compelling. Uh, but again, they, uh, they, added it, but required anyone with PTSD to have two forms signed, um, which, you know, is so. Um, and we have raised the issue uh, over the years on, um, on opiate addiction. And because we have seen in other states where uh, one of the qualifying conditions is addiction and uh, that has hit uh, a, a wall too. Um, I think, you know, people might think, well, you're just trading one drug for another, but um, certainly uh, I think if someone, and, and we have heard from patients who have had, you know, surgeries and they are not taking the opiates, they are only using cannabis to relieve that pain uh, when they recover. And, and that's to me is, is really powerful um, to hear that. I think that, you know, it's just, um, as we've seen, you know, 2018, we legalized cannabis. Now, you know, uh, the legislature has supported, uh, you know, retail stores and yet we keep this program so tight 
And I will tell you that, you know, the Vermont Medical Society has not been supportive. They have fought us all the way. Every time we bring up a bill, they are in there to oppose us. And um, it, it, it definitely has, uh, I'll just give you an example of a very close friend of mine who I lost last summer, but as he was battling cancer, asked his oncologist to uh, you know, sign the form so that he could use cannabis because he wanted to not be on all the opiates that they were giving him and the anxiety medication that they were giving him. And the doctor said to him, just go out on the street and buy it. It's, there's so much stuff out there. And to me, that is just not okay. And one of the things that has really lacked in this state has been education for healthcare professionals. And I uh, reached out a few years ago to the Medical Society and I asked them to invite uh, the dispensaries in to talk. Um, I was able to get um, uh, two uh, doctors who were involved with the Vermont Patients Alliance to uh, go to their meeting, but it was basically, they were given a workshop in competition with all these other workshops. So very few people came to it. But I, I really think that um, we, we need to do more education and understanding of the benefits of uh, what cannabis can be for so many different uh, patients across the state. Thanks for that. Um, just really quickly follow up. Is there um, any active legislation this year uh, around the medical program or this biennium that's on the wall anywhere? No, uh, we were going to uh, introduce a bill uh, this year. Um, and, you know, I will say that, you know, Senator Sears and Senator White and other senators have been champions for this program. And I have only praise for them for the work that they have done over the years of trying to improve this program. Um, after having a discussion with Senator Sears, uh, he really felt that the bill should be introduced in the House. Yep. And um, it was, so anyhow, I, I, we, we have not introduced a bill. Uh, we're thinking about um, possibly for this year yep. and um, trying to kind of identify the champions that are in the house that um, would be willing to do this. Yeah, okay, good to know. Um, Meg, I just have one quick question for you. We're running a little short on time and it's just through no fault of your own, just uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're having some, we had some issues getting up and running. Um, could you talk just a little bit on the on the piece about education? Could you talk a little bit about um, CVD or series, um, how they, when they when they're meeting a patient for the first time, um, how they kind of educate the patient who might be anxious about trying cannabis and how they match up the specific product uh, to the kind of needs of the patient, how they, you know, a patient who may be low information about cannabis and, you know, trying it for the first time, but they need, you know, RSO or a FICO oil, you know, some, something that may, that they may not even know about. Um, so how, how do you match up the products and how do you kind of educate maybe a low marrow, low cannabis information patient? Sure. So we uh, start by having an initial consultation in that consultation, we have our welcome packet, which provides all of the uh, information, you know, so that they patients can refer back to it. But really, it's just about having a conversation, getting to know what that person is comfortable with. Our motto has always been start low, go slow. So, you know, don't jump right to something that you're unsure of. Start with maybe some of these smaller doses and slowly titrate up. We recommend that people also keep a journal so that they're able to track how a certain product made them feel. Um, but really it's all about understanding their comfort level, what their past um, experiences have been with cannabis, understanding what works for them in terms of whatever medical condition they have. So some patients are absolutely not going to want to smoke. Uh, so we have things like edibles or oils or tinctures. Um, and then just really walking them through what using that product might look like, how comfortable they are with that, and um, getting to understand what, what symptoms it is they're looking to address. 
Um, and from there, our staff is really knowledgeable. They can recommend a variety of products or a combination of products that they think might work best. And then it's really all about just testing for the, the individual. You know, everybody is different. Cannabis affects everybody differently. And so it's just kind of holding their hand through that process until they find something that works for them. Gotcha. And do you have a like a training program for your uh, the people that are doing those initial consultations? Yeah, so when um, we hire someone, they do go through kind of our basic training, and then there is some training on the retail side about product information, um, and then kind of a you know compassion training essentially. So we want to make sure that not only is staff knowledgeable about products, but they're also comfortable interacting with people who have some pretty heavy medical conditions and diseases that they're handling. That's great. We're, we're running short on time. I know that we all probably could, you know, just, you know, have this conversation for, for hours and hours. Um, fortunately, Meg will be uh, serving on our advisory panel, so we will have access to her background and her knowledge on this. Um, are there any uh, quick questions, Kyle, Julie, um, that you have before we move to public comment? I have just one quick one. How long does that training program take, Meg? And is there a retraining program on a regular basis? Sure. So um, the initial training is done over the course of the first couple of weeks of employment. And Anytime we have a new product or, you know, a change to a product, staff is retrained on it. Um, so I would say it's just a consistent, constant training process versus, uh, okay, it's time for your annual retraining. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thank, thank you both. Do you guys have any concluding thoughts for us or any information you'd like to pass on before we, before we move on? Uh, no, I just want to thank you again for uh, for having doing this and uh, looking forward to the program being under the cannabis board. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move to public comment. Um, so uh, we're going to kind of go. I guess Kyle, I don't know if anyone's in in the build in the physical space with you. Uh, nope, just me and Nelly right now. Okay. All right. Well, then, feels the need. Feel free to come on down till two. Okay. So we're going to do this just in two phases, just to help facilitate those of who have joined through the link and are watching the video. Um, if you could raise your virtual hand, if you'd like to make a public comment, and then we'll move to anyone who's joined via the phone. Um, so we'll start with anyone uh, with their kind of virtual hand raised. Uh, Jeffrey? Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. It's good to see everybody yep. once again. Uh, thank you for holding this meeting. Um, so, uh, Jeffrey Pizzatello, for the record, uh, Executive Director and Founder of Vermont Growers Association. I'm here today uh, in this capacity uh, as a caregiver, uh, VMR-registered uh, caregiver. I'd like to make a couple quick points um, it was brought up uh, from our guests previously that, uh, quote, uh, the only way uh, for the dispensaries to survive is to enter the adult use market. I would just like to point out that um, last year, uh, as recently as last year, um, a Vermont media company had reported that the parent company for Champlain Valley Dispensary reported $35 million in total sales last year. Uh, so I would just ask you how many businesses in Vermont bring in that level of sales. Uh, as, as we think about um, these concerns and moving forward, I would also like to point out, and this is important um, framing for us, um, Meg, uh, and she seems knowledgeable, uh, is the uh, position for the advisory committee. Um, there is no conversation uh, about adding uh, an additional member of the advisory committee until actually we brought it up. So, and we introduced this concept of uh, including a patient advocacy, a patient voice, and a, and a healthcare professional that understands the unique challenges of patients and caregivers. 
So we introduced that concept and instead it got redefined as a member or a designee of the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Uh, and that's important because that is framing broadly the sentiments of countless individuals in the medical program in Vermont in the state. In that we seek uh, effectiveness, we seek medication, we seek improvement to this program, only often, unfortunately, and we see this in other states, to get co-opted by those with resources. So we made an attempt to have uh, an individual who could speak to our concerns, uh, and that got taken over, unfortunately. So we, we think that position should not exist. That should be someone who's reflective of caregivers, patients, and most likely a healthcare professional, as we had initially suggested. I want to leave you guys with one anecdote about uh, my experience with the dispensaries, because I think that's what you guys are talking about. I think that's important. So uh, the very first time my patient purchased uh, a product from uh, our designate, de designated dispensary, which is Champlain Valley Dispensary, we purchased, uh, she purchased flour and some concentrates. Uh, she went to go consume the concentrates, and the concentrates did not combust naturally it sparked and sizzled, which typically designates contaminant. So we purchased a medical product with a contaminant in it. And so it was brought up by our previous guests that the reason why uh, the VMR is depleting and individuals do not purchase products from them is because of competition from the illicit market. That is not true. If they offered safe, effective, healthy products as other states do at a reasonable cost, they would have consumers bottom line. In Maine, their average cost of an ounce is just over $200. The average cost in our state is over $400. They have a decentralized market that allows Mainers to get in and participate and engage. I would urge you guys to stay open and innovative about ways to improve this program. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, next on my list is Bridget Conry. Bridget, if, you, if you're able to, please unmute yourself and if you'd like to join with video. Hi. So I'm Bridget Conry, and I am the Director of Brand Experience for Champlain Valley Dispensary, Southern Vermont, Southern Vermont Wellness, now known as Series Med. And I just wanted to add something to Virginia and Meg's testimony about one of the things that has gained no traction in the legislature or the DPS that we've been advocating for on the record since 2016, which is the inclusion of Vermont's craft growers to be licensed to provide product for the medical market. We strongly believe that they should be part of that market. We've been advocating for it, and it just hasn't gotten any traction. So that's um, something that we really will continue to advocate for. Um, I also wanted to just speak a little bit about reciprocity and why reciprocity is important. Uh, cannabis remains federally illegal, and when people are using medical cannabis for symptom relief and for health reasons, they face prosecution if they are going to be traveling uh, in different states um, with their product. And so being able to provide medical patients legally with a product while they are in our state is something that is um, really important for people so they don't have to be at risk of prosecution. And that's it. Thank you, appreciate Thank the time. You, yeah. Um, next, I see uh, Tito Byrne. Tito, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for hearing me out. Um, my name is Tito Byrne. I own Byrne Gallery and Byrne Living Organics. And I have opinions about almost pretty much every single aspect of everything we're talking about. And, um, and I really appreciate you allowing us to be a part of it. And um, I, I enjoy being part of the process uh, along each step along the way. And, um, but today I just want to talk about my experience as a caretaker. Um, it has broken my heart over the years to have to deny person after uh, medical patient after medical patient uh, because I can only caretake for one person. And it's just such a shame. Um, I, I feel like my product is, is far superior to what's offered at the dispensaries, and um, and it's just a shame that I have to deny people. Um, and these are cancer patients. These are these are people who really really need it. So um, that's that's all for today. But uh, thanks for hearing me out. Thank thank you, Tito. Um, and anyone else who joined via the link? 
I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so I turn to people that are on the phone if you'd like to uh, provide public comment. Um, you know, to unmute yourself, just hit star six, and uh, you can just start talking. If you could identify yourself for the record, if you'd like to provide comment. Okay, so um, Julie and Kyle, we have a break scheduled. However, we have, um, I think, a number of our patients and caregivers that are on the line um, currently. And I'm wondering maybe if we could forego our break uh, now and maybe if there's a little bit of extra time, we could um, just take a, a slightly longer lunch. Yes, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Great. Well, first, so we're moving towards um, patients and caregivers. You know, I've I've met with a number of patients and caregivers and patient advocates um, since we since I've been appointed, and um, I think that there are some very powerful stories that talk about um, the inability to access access or um, kind of the quality or the consistency um, of uh, the medical program. And so I'd like to first um, talk to Amelia Meishi, if, if you're there, Amelia, um, to kind of help us understand your story and some of the um, kind of barriers uh, that have been put in your way to accessing medical cannabis. Yeah. Um, hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> hi, Amelia. Good to see you again. It's good to see everybody again. Um, yeah, so I just want to, I want to thank for Amelia, I'm wondering, um, if you might, if you, if you kill your video or, or stop your video, um, it, we're getting a Lord. little bit of, I don't know if other people are getting that, but for me, okay. it's a little chunky. I heard that, but uh, I'm not sure if it was part of a a longer sentence. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay, cool. Um, there might be a bit of a lag. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, so our internet reception is not great. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank Meg and Virginia for speaking and for the work that Virginia has put into uh, improving the medical program over the years. I think that's great. Um, I also just wanted to speak to a couple of the things that Virginia and Meg spoke to. Um, the first, I think Jeffrey touched on it, but the first thing being that people are not signing up for the medical registry because of things like um, paperwork and competition from the illicit market. And I can tell you that people are not signing up for the medical registry anymore and they are dropping off of it due to mainly the cost of medicine um, and also to the inaccessibility geographically of the dispensaries. A lot of us live, I know that when I got my card, I lived in Eden, which was at least an hour away from any of the closest dispensaries. Um, and we live in a state with very little public transportation. Uh, and while they do offer delivery, it's still very difficult to kind of be in sync with the dispensaries in that manner, as well as financial accessibility. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. And then the other point I wanted to make was I can appreciate that the dispensaries have done everything they've done at great risk um, to themselves. But I would also like to point out that in the illicit market and with caregivers, they have also carried the burden of a really big risk. Uh, federally. Um, I know that a few years ago, my sister and I had a caregiver who was a legal caregiver, and he had a legal grow and a legal amount of plants. Um, and his partner called the police on him, and they came and without asking if his grow was legal, without giving him a chance to present his card, they went and they cut the plants down, and my sister was out of luck on medicine. Um, so I, I just want to point out that, yes, the dispensaries have had a very great risk, but the illicit growers that are currently helping patients and caretakers have also carried a, a big risk. And I just wanted that to be acknowledged. Um, so 
I just want to go into some of the changes I think would be beneficial to the program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry if you guys have heard these before, but my position hasn't really changed much. So I'm just going to go into the list. Uh, the first thing would be to eliminate the three month requirement for a bona fide healthcare professional. A uh, patient relationship, that three month requirement is a big barrier to entry. When you've got somebody who, for instance, is moving into the state, we don't have reciprocity. So they have to wait three months before they can access their medicine. Um, that three month requirement is also a hindrance to people with chronic illnesses like me. Uh, if I were to change my doctor and my card were, were lapsed, I would have to wait three months with that doctor before I could get a new card. Um, the next point would be, uh, I'd like to see the patient possession limit increased from two mature plants to 12 mature plants with no immature plant cap. Um, I think that our plant possession limits and our flower possession limits are criminally low for medical patients. Um, and when you think about the sheer amount of product it takes to make effective medicine, asking for 12 plants is not, is not that much of a, a request. Um, the next would be to allow patients and caregivers to purchase cannabis and cannabis infused products from any adult use dispensary without paying medical patient taxes, which would be that 16% cannabis tax. Uh, patients already don't have to pay that tax in the medical dispensaries, which is great, but we'd like to see the options broadened for medicine and, uh, if a patient could walk in any adult use dispensary, show their card and just not have to pay that tax, that would be a really easy way for us to increase access to medicine for patients. The next would be to allow adult use dispensaries to deliver to patients. Um, medical already has that. I think that once again, if we allow patients to buy from these adult use dispensaries, they should be allowed to deliver medicine to patients who maybe are not able to access the physical locations. A big point is we want to eliminate the fingerprint requirement for caregivers. This was added in um, Act 164. It did not exist previously. And once again, it is just a barrier to entry. There are a lot of people who could be very good caregivers who will not enter the program because of that fingerprint requirement. We already require a copy of your ID. We require to know where your house is and the room in your house where you are growing and the understanding that your grow could be inspected at any time. Um, so adding a fingerprint requirement to that is just overkill. Um, eliminating the requirement that patients with chronic diseases reapply annually for their medical card. So if you have a lifelong condition like I do, um, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and I have Crohn's disease. Uh, both are incurable um, and one is degenerative. So it's only going to get worse as I get older. Uh, and so having to go in and ask my doctor for a card every single year doesn't really make sense because I'm never going to not need it. Um, next would be to allow caregivers to caregive for five patients like New York allows. I know that Tito just brought this up as an awesome point. Um, and he's right. We have a lot of people who could benefit from having a caregiver who maybe don't know somebody who can grow for them or maybe the person that they know who grows can't do that because they already have a patient that's registered to them. Um, and so, yeah, I think if we allow caregivers to caregive for five patients at a time, that just increases a patient's access to medicine. Uh, the next would be to allow each patient to have three caregivers. Um, so if you are a patient and you have a caregiver and your caregiver gets, for instance, a, a mold infestation because outdoor in Vermont is on drugs or their medicine burns gone so that they they don't have to go an extended period without their medicine uh, the next would be to allow me I think it's a great point I think that we have a lot of people that come in from out of state um, and and those people should be allowed to participate in our program. And that's their personal choice. And we've got 
to respect it, but we also have to respect that those people are still sick and they are still patients. So just yeah, I think because that last, it, they that don't, don't want to be on the registry shouldn't mean that they the caps are really detrimental in medicine. Um, and, and so yeah, yeah, yeah I was like, Oh, sorry, Amelia. Sorry, you're am I glitchy again? A little bit, but that last point you made was about reciprocity. Was that? Sorry, Amelia. We Can were, you hear uh, me? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know. Like, I'm out in the kind of middle of nowhere as well, and I know that you know sometimes the satellites need to kind of you know be overhead or something. But yeah, I think I think you're coming through now. Okay, cool. Sorry, like I said, middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just to speak to that last point I was making, THC caps are really, uh, once again, they're a barrier for patients who need that kind of medicine. Um, and I think we were talking last week about how when you take something like FICO and then you turn it into like an edible gummy, say, for a cancer patient who um, would prefer that, you're then turning it into an edible. So the THC cap on edibles uh, would just absolutely prohibit that. Um, yeah. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is the um, medical cannabis fund. I believe it's called the Medical Marijuana Fund. Um, January 1st, when you guys get the program, that fund is set to be folded into the Cannabis Regulation Fund. And once again, I'm just asking that it be separated from the Cannabis Regulation Fund and used specifically for the medical program and the patients. Um, and that was it. I know I know you guys have heard these points before, but they're, I think that in the past, this program has been focused on the dispensaries' voices and what the dispensaries think is best for patients and less on hearing specifically from patients what they need. I think that Virginia brought up an awesome, awesome thing when she said that you know, various things about this program have been brought forth through patient testimony. So it began with somebody with AIDS who needed to use cannabis. And then again, when they added PTSD, it was because a patient came forward and testified. And so we see these big things happening when we include patients' voices and we prioritize patients' voices. Um, and I'm really appreciative that you guys seem to be following that trend. Well, thank you, Amelia. Um, thanks for coming forward. Thank you for your advocacy. I know that we have all listened to your testimony in the past when you were in the House GovOps Committee and, and other places, but um, it's really important for us as a board to kind of build our own record so that we can make recommendations um, to the legislature around some of these issues. So thank you for kind of, you know, coming forward once again and, and telling us your story. Um, I'd like to open it if you're if you're up for it um, for a few questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, can I just ask a clarifying question about um, the three month waiting or the relationship with a physician? That has to be a Vermont physician. Is that correct? Yes. So it couldn't if you spent part of your year in another state and part of your year in Florida, you'd have to have two physicians. Yes, you would have to have two separate medical cards. OK. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it does it's not limited to just the physician, naturopathic doctors. Care. I guess it depends on how you define Care. physician. Uh, yeah, caregiver or treating physician, however we want to define that. Yeah, um, whatever your health it has to be like a licensed healthcare professional. So for instance, I got my card through um, my geneticist, which is a specialist. So it doesn't have to be through your PCP. I, I think my thought is that another deterrent is that if you have to, if you spend part of the year in another state, then you have to do these visits twice and have these relationships in two different states potentially. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that would be an argument for reciprocity for sure. Amelia, I have a question. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. And I can totally, uh, I, I understand and appreciate how your, um, you know, uh, medical history means that you don't, you, you shouldn't, have to go every single year to get a new card or have that card kind of renewed, um, however you want to call it. And I'm, I'm sorry that it's unfortunate that that's the situation you're in. But I'm wondering for, for other folks that um, are currently part of the program or 
depending on other physical or mental ailments that might be accepted into the program somewhere down the few, down the line. Does that kind of card holder in perpetuity kind of make sense for everybody or depending on a certain person's situation, might it make sense to have that card, you know, um, have some type of, of, of life to it, kind of like a driver's license? Um, yeah. wondering if there's some type of middle, middle, middle ground depending on, you know, a, a patient's, their ability to get better and beyond whatever they're currently facing. Yeah, um, so one point I actually didn't bring up was that we want to expand the definition of a debilitating medical condition to include any disease, condition, or treatment in, as determined by their doctor. Um, and when we do this, uh, we want that doctor to kind of, the way I see it and the way that I think that it could work is if we have two different types of cards, we have this chronic illness long-term card and we have a year card like we have right now. And that would be up to the doctor's discretion which one they think that the patient needs, um, which is no different really than writing any other prescriptions. You have short-term prescriptions that you need for a short period of time because you're dealing with a condition that will end at some point, or you have long-term long-term prescriptions. I do infusions every six weeks for my Crohn's disease, and I'm going to do them the rest of my life. I don't have to every single you know, year go back and and my, have my doctor say, well, do you still need it? Because they know I'm still going to need it. However, if I was on, you know, if I was going through a bout of something like mono, for instance, and I was on certain drugs for mono, at some point that mono is going to end, but it's still a long-term illness. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm just trying to get, I guess, comfort, recognizing that so many people are facing so many different physical and mental ailments. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious to put a blanket number or whatever you want to call it on everybody's totally. you know, certain situation. So thank totally. you so much. I, I just, I really think that it should be like up to the doctor and the patient. Um, yeah, yeah, that's where, I, that's where I was getting towards versus something yeah. uh, more outlined in, in statute. So cool. Thank you. Amelia, um, I'm curious, uh, just if you were going to purchase uh, cannabis exclusively from a dispensary, do you have any kind of estimation as to what your either monthly or weekly cost would be to you? Um, <laughs> well, I haven't, I, I'll be straightforward. I haven't purchased cannabis from the dispensaries since probably 2015. Right. Um, but back when I was a, a frequent proprietor of the dispensaries, I was spending about a thousand dollars every two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm just, curious what what was your kind of experience like when you first joined the the um when you first joined the registry and you first kind of went to the dispensaries i mean was your doctor willing to kind of you know were they accessible on this issue or did you you know was there kind of some difficulty in getting them to think about cannabis as a potential uh, medicine um so my pcp actually wouldn't write me a card so I had to go to my geneticist who was more than willing. I was 19 at the time. Um, so my, my doctor was just a little weary about giving a 19 year old a medical card, um, which is what it is. But my geneticist was very quick to sign my prescription papers. Um, and then from there, I'll say the system itself was not that difficult to navigate. Um, I signed a few papers, I sent them into DPS along with my $50 and I got my card. Um, getting into the dispensaries was pretty easy. Um, and the product selection at the time was not bad at all. I would say there were multiple strains. There were multiple different kinds of edibles. They were doing concentrates at that point. Um, and really the biggest thing that took me out of it was the cost and just how much more affordable it was to grow, grow my own. Um, and accessibility, I would say the dispensary was really far away. And uh, at a certain point, I lived in Massachusetts, and if we had had reciprocity, honestly, I probably would have come back to Vermont and just bought 
my products from the Vermont dispensary and gone back home, but I couldn't. Uh, so there were a few barriers, but like, I know that a lot of us patients kind of rag on the dispensary and maybe we do it to an extent that's not fair given the limitations that they've faced. Um, but cost is such a huge barrier. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Can it, can I ask you, um, you know, it sounds like, you know, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like you've kind of figured out a few strains or a few products that are actually helpful for you. Um, so how do you make sure that you have access to those plants or how did you get them initially? And I don't mean to, you don't have to say any names or anything like that, but I'm just, you know, it's, it's curious to me that, you know, potentially you might need a very specific strain and that might not be kind of what your neighbor is growing or your, you know, that like that you can get easily access kind of a, a clone or a plant. Um, I'll say that the, that we have a, not just like a, a market of talented growers who are going to come into the adult use space who have been growing at home for the last 10, 15, 20 years, but we also have a really compassionate network of people. Um, so we have a, a community of people who are trading cuts, who are giving free medicine out to each other to see what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, you know, I, I've gotten cuts from Jesse Lynn, who's going to speak later, who specifically grows medicine for a nurse with cancer. And the cultivars that she has target cancer symptoms, nausea, pain, uh, you know, insomnia. And so I would say that the the biggest thing, yeah, that supported me in being a home growing patient is the community um, of people that are just trying to help patients at this point because they know how expensive the dispensaries are. Yeah. Uh, any more questions for Amelia? Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. So next on our list was Meredith Mann. Um, I've seen her kind of pop in and out of our guest list. I'm wondering, Meredith, if you're here with us now. I am here. Okay, Meredith, um, thank you for your willingness to kind of share. I'd love for you, if you could, just to give us a little bit of your background and then kind of talk to us about the things that you think that we could do as we refresh and reimagine our medical program. Thank you, and thank you, Amelia. That was excellent. And I want to say I really agree with Amelia. Reciprocity is really important, mostly for uh, the risks that patients take without it is unnecessary, um, regardless of if it's lifelong or an acute situation. People are taking risks that they shouldn't have to take, and it should be more accessible. Um, thank you to Virginia and Meg as well. It's always good to see and hear from the dispensary and get their opinion. Um, I am a business owner. I own Magic Man. I'm also a medical patient. I have been for uh, four years now, uh, you know, in Vermont. I've been pretty much a lifelong medical patient. Uh, that was just when I got access. Uh, I also was a supervisor at the dispensary and worked there for a while. And I have an inside perspective of patients and patients' needs. Um, and that's why I worked at the dispensary is to get the patient care, um, to give the patient care that I needed, that I wanted to give back. Um, and it's very clear that uh, we need much more access. People need choices. Um, you know, uh, People really are only as good as their initial visit at the dispensary and the information they get. And uh, people need access to bud tenders that have education, training. There should be levels of bud tenders for recreational and as well as for the medical side uh, that can give people what they need. Um, and I don't just see that on the medical side. I see it every day at Magic Man. Everybody's a patient, even if they're there for their mental wellness, they're still a patient of some kind. And everybody 
has a story. Um, they may be just grabbing a blunt to have a good time, but you know, there's the person right behind them has an incredible, compelling story and issue. Um, for me, it just pains me every day not to be able to give people what they need. It's absolutely heartbreaking, as Tito said, uh, to have people in front of you that are in extreme pain and not be able to help them. And a lot of these people are medical patients who can't afford the medicine, um, or they are people that don't have access to the medical program. Last month, I printed out 20 marijuana registry forms just to give people access. Um, they were gone in 10 minutes. Uh, and it's not about my faith in the program. It's about my belief in the access. And I'm also not saying I don't have faith in the existing program, but um, I have my ups and downs with it. Um, what I really do think is important is that people trust the person they're talking to. It's what I see in here every day. You have to have experience. Cannabis is anecdotal. And the more people you help and the more people you communicate just helps the next person. And that's the best way we can provide that is to share those experiences and each person's experience right now until we have all this federal testing is what guides um, the, the whole experience for a specific person. Um, I believe, you know, in the three month limit is just um, having to have a relationship with your doctor for three months is absolutely crazy, really difficult in Vermont for people. People have a hard enough time finding a PCP and then they get bumped from a different insurance, then they lose a job. Or do, 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 do. Um, most people right now with the state of healthcare aren't lucky enough to have a PCP they have a relationship with. Um, and uh, not all doctors are willing to go out on that limb. A lot more are, but which we're grateful for. Um, you know, from where I stand, I'm just committed to providing education on cannabis, education on the medicine and what people need, how I can help them with strains. And if I can't help them, who can? Um, and I think that it's really important that we all work together on that. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And, you know, I have a lot of insight and information and experience from working at the dispensary that I'm happy to share with you in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Yeah. Lord, any, any questions for Meredith? Um, I have some questions about uh, like the medical training or the training at the dispensaries. Is there, and I should have asked this earlier, but is there training that's specific to um, like medical knowledge or medical professionals in the dispensary? No, um, there, there isn't. Uh, but, you know, what I did, you know, the people in there who really care, we're spending all of our time gathering that information, researching it, being a part of the process. Um, I would say that depends on the individual bud tender or person in there. Um, I was provided with training from CVD. I, there was a group of us, I think I was told we were the first group that came in and went through CAT. We were given, you know, a, a good amount of just your basic clinical information, what I would honestly expect from anybody who I would want blood tending for me, it would be the bare basic. Um, and I think there is a place for a bud tender with your very basic skills, but there's also a place for a bud tender um, who's dealing with people with chronic conditions and chronic pain or mental illness or can't, whatever it is. Um, even here at Magic Man, you know, I have deal with people on a weekly basis who are in palliative care at the end of their life. That weighs emotionally on me sometimes because I'm like, where are they? Are they gonna come in? Are they okay? You know, um, so as a bud, if you're, if you care and you're a bud tender, you tend to, you know, actually care and take on the issues. And uh, 
it's also important for bud tenders to have mental health access and care for them because there's a lot of heavy heavy conversations and um you know if you take in all that energy it can be hard on that bud tender too and to be professional at what you're doing you have to learn to give people the information and not let it way too heavily on you so that is really really important and something i saw a lot on the inside is how heavy it weighs on people so yeah. the emotional training is as important as the cannabis education um so yeah back to specific conditions you asked about um i think uh really you shouldn't i would i never speak to anything i can't speak to so um, if I need to call Jesse Lynn, I'll call Jesse Lynn. If I need to ask somebody who works at a dispensary, I will. If I need to call a doctor, I will. But, or send somebody to somebody that can help them. But, you know, for bud tenders, um, really one thing that I'm the most proud of is that people seek me out because they trust me, because I care, I'm not in it for anything else other than that. And I want that to continue to be the case. And I, I want people to have the choices to seek out who they want and one, what they want. Um, you know, uh, the dispensary could be, or CBD could be the absolute best place in the world with the best flower and cheapest prices, but they there should be choices for people. Um, and, you know, speaking also to the affordable accessibility end of this, um, the prices are just, you know, it, it's painful to watch. You know, the average person coming in there and dropping $500 to $1,000, like Amelia said, in cash, um, can't afford that. And it's, it's painful to watch. And we're gonna have to find a way for dispensaries. And, you know, this is all gonna come down to cultivation and flower prices and you know but we have to find a way to make sure the prices um make sense so that we can provide patients with what they need absolutely tax-free um 100 of course um is really important uh when you go into colorado i think that was my favorite vision is you know you have your choices you have your choice in what kind of dispensary you want to go to, um, where you want to go. You can go this way for medical, this way for rec. You may have different bud tenders with different training. Um, I'd like to see a much a strong bud tender training program in the state so that people, wherever they go, know that they have quality um, and caring people that they can trust and ask questions to. And I'll give the whole program integrity. And there's no portable certification program right now. There's no, I'm certified as a bud tender and I can take that wherever I go to do that right now. Um, there are some trainings like nationally that um, I don't know how well they transfer in different states there. I haven't seen one specifically that applies to here as well. I think it you know, wouldn't take too much or maybe it would, but you know, I think it's having our own standards of that would make the most sense. Um, you know, one other thing that a bud tender said to me in Colorado was that, you know, he said, you're never going to lose the medical patients, even, even on the rec side, everybody's, everybody's a patient and it's just important to give them that not that information and that knowledge. Um, sort of as Amelia touched on, not everybody can get into the medical program. Not everybody, um, you know, some people are caring and don't want to apply and lose their gun rights. There's a million reasons why people will stay rec, even if they have a very strong medical need for it. Um, and then I would just say also, you know, um, you know, as far as patients go, just, you know, they're making sure they have access to what they need. Those those THC caps um, are just going to push people to the black market or, 
not, you know, if they're a medical patient, they should just be able to have a right. Everybody should have a right to get what they want. I, uh, I just want to acknowledge um, Eric and Jesse Lynn, who are our next two witnesses, but uh, we just thank you for joining us. I just, uh, we're going to take a few more minutes with Meredith and then Eric will turn to you next if you're all right with that. Um, um, Kyle, do you have uh, any more questions for Meredith? Hi, Meredith. It's great to meet you, Kyle Harris. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if I have a question, more of a comment. And I'm interesting and interested in the training conversation. And I'd love to, um, you know, whether it's talking with you or everybody else offline or talking in, in this type of setting at a, at a later date. I'm wondering if who a good organization. If you have any thoughts, Meredith, my, my head goes to VTC because they do a lot of these kind of type of technical trainings. I know they've got some classes oriented towards growing um, industrial hemp, at least um, at their Randolph campus. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on if that would be, should we have a conversation with them about if they're interested in doing these types of trainings or who, who else or what other organizations around the state would be well positioned and have the expertise to really you know, have a conversation with when it comes to that? Um, you know, I think as long as the conversation's open to, you know, cannabis experts as well, someone like VTC could provide accessibility of the program through the state to rural areas as well. Um, and, uh, you know, on that note of rural areas, I do, you know, want to say that, you um, part of that accessibility is delivery. Um, and part, what I did do deliveries for CBD and it's really important to say that when you're making a delivery, um, I've never felt, it was one of the things I did that I felt the most in debt to, to making sure that I got from one side of the state to the other in the right time and everybody got what they needed. But also as a bud tender, that person on the road, I think I, I had some more intense conversations and interactions with patients on the road in those rural areas when I was dropping product off to them that couldn't come in. So, you know, making sure that that, you know, that transfers as well into delivering to patients, because those are the people sort of like Amelia said, that really need that information and knowledge. And because they're so disconnected, they don't have it. So to have someone come to you, but not just come to you and drop off and be like, here you go, but be able to connect the dots for you and help you with your dose and take five, 10 minutes to talk to you is important to people. Yeah, I mean, so, so I guess what I'm hearing from you, and I know Meg had kind of given us an overview of how they do an initial consultation with, with folks who, you know, are designated their um, dispensary, but it might be, some folks obviously you know, don't feel comfortable talking about their thoughts, feelings, conditions in that type of setting. It might be if we do, if, if a deliver, you know, making sure that that educational aspect is carried through to, from a delivery service perspective, just because folks might feel more comfortable in their own home. Of, Absolutely. Um, and the other okay. thing is that you can, um, and I did do initial visits when I was there um, quite often. It was one of my favorite things to do. Um, but, you know, each patient is different. Um, and like any situation, they have a lot to tell you. You have a lot to go over in a short time. And it's really, you know, whatever you medicine they leave with, that's really just the beginning of the conversation and the questions. As much information as they could possibly have is going to dictate it, be dictated by their experience. Um, so you know, to be able to really follow through with that with people is important. Um, and it is a longer process of trust um, for the average person, for sure. And um, yeah, they need I, to I be don't think, yeah, I don't, uh, Meg didn't touch on that aspect of delivery and everything. I don't want to make any assumptions that they don't try and do outreach that way. Maybe if Meg has okay. thoughts Me on that, neither. we can hear from her later. I, I don't know, but just, just trying to follow the Mm -hmm. the path least resistance on what makes the most sense from an educational perspective. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you.
Meredith, um, I just have one follow-up question for you. I, I I have to assume, you know, we we've been hearing a few consistent recommendations. One is around the three-month kind of relationship with doctors, um, certainly increasing the kind of patient count for caregivers, uh, increasing some of the plant counts, or, or these are some consistent um, um, recommendations we've been hearing. Um, allowing reciprocity, allowing uh, a cardholder to, to visit any dispensary. Um, we heard a recommendation today that I, that I hadn't heard before, which is the inclusion of craft growers to provide plants to the dispensaries. Um, can you just maybe give me your thoughts on that if you, if you support it or if it's something that if there's a, something that I'm not thinking about, why that wouldn't be a good idea? Um, I can't, I, I think that the dispensaries need the craft growers. Um, absolutely. They need variety. They need to be able to keep product in stock. They need to have what people need when they need it. And even sometimes that doesn't always happen there, um, even with the best interests at heart. So, um, I think you, you have to involve your community. You have to involve the growers and it all starts with them and absolutely um, we need to get them involved in as soon as possible. It all starts with them or with right. us. Yeah. yeah. Well, Meredith, uh, I can't thank you enough, really. I mean, uh, it sounds like you've been involved in every aspect of this business um, and uh, you've been you know, providing education and support to patients uh, and yourself for your entire career. So thank you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your hard work, both of all of you. And I look forward to helping you any way I can moving forward. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Um Eric, are you uh with us? Yes. I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, good. How's it going over there? It's going well. So All Eric, right. you and I spoke um, after I watched a video of you on, on YouTube, just telling a really compelling story um, about your patient that you care give. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I'd love to hear the story. I know it, you know it can be painful to have to retell these stories in multiple different locations, multiple different times, but I think it's important for our board to hear the story. And I think it's important for us to hear from you about some of the ways that we can reimagine um, the medical program as we are facing kind of the advent of adult use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Basically for the people who hadn't seen or heard, uh, I ended up being a caregiver to a very young child who has uh, brain cancer and she was very little at the time, so the state was a little bit, uh, the, the, the cannabis program was a little cautious with how we went about it. So they, they wanted Champlain Valley Dispensary to be the um, dispensary of choice for us because for whatever reason, they, they weren't comfortable with any of the other ones at the time dealing with such a small kid. So that put me, I was in Stowe, the kid is down in Randolph, that put me in between the two places. So I took the job on as, as being the, the middleman for that. And so that gave me the experience to see what the state had for the program, where the shortcomings were, um, what we had to do to supplement what they couldn't do. And it pretty much, my experience substantiated pretty much everything you guys have been hearing from not being able to get enough, uh, inconvenience of it, us having to kind of thwart the edges of the system to make up the for the lacking. Um, so pretty much plant counts, um, the amount you can get, the cost of it, uh, the accessibility, it was all a bit challenging and difficult. Uh, there were times other people had to skirt the law and bring stuff that they got elsewhere to donate to the cause for us because it's a pretty high dose protocol when you're trying to use the cannabis to actually uh, affect the cancer and not just provide uh, appetite stimulation or stuff like that. 
So the dispensaries were held back on how much they could even sell us a month versus how much the protocols for that kind of thing call for. So those are uh, a few of the things that we had discussed that would be addressed here and that I thought would be good for me to chime in with our experiences. So her cancers took a little bit, pretty much about two years. It, it, there was a recurrence and uh, first it was one tumor and that started to, with a very low dose protocol was working and then seven new tumors popped up in her head. And that made us ramp up to the protocols that, that are pretty much all over the internet, substantiated with some studies that are done overseas in Israel and Spain and stuff. Um, so that second round, we really ramped up pretty much everything we were doing. And that's when we started to find that it was a little too expensive. First of all, we couldn't get enough uh, to, to do the protocols that are regularly used. And uh, in the end of it all, you know, the laws were changing at the time. Some things have been addressed since that. Um, some things haven't, so there's still the challenges that we faced, some of them not so much, but those are what you guys have been discussing already here, and uh, and I'm here to just say we experienced all that in, in real time. What, what I, what's interesting, most interesting to me about your situation and your story is that um, it really is at the intersection of all of the issues that we've been hearing about. And it's complicated, of course, by the fact that your patient um, is under 21, um, mm -hmm. in fact, significantly under 21, meaning that um, there is no, you know, you hear from some people, oh, just, you know, send this person to the adult use market. Well, that's not really an option um, for your right. mm -hmm. uh, So on that note, my, I mean, if your patient uh, didn't have access to the registry, what would her alternatives be? What were the kind of alternative kind of uh, suggestions that the doctors were giving her other than the registry? There weren't many other than following their protocols of chemo and radiation. And after the first runs of chemo, when seven more tumors came back, they took that off of the table for the second round because of some data suggesting that that can cause more tumors in the right circumstances. So they didn't want to, just in case that was part of that, go through that again. So what the doctors were pretty much doing, there was a little bit of nutrition change stuff, not really a, not a lot from what we considered. Um, we pretty much um, we went through everything you can come across as far as what would in, improve her chances. Um, there wasn't a lot of that out of the hospital. There was a little bit, but not not excessively. Um, so they they were more, you know, go through our chemo, our radiation, just let us take care of that part. Uh, we did all of the the extra home stuff and making sure that any damages that happened from that could be mitigated, and any extra chance we could give her would be there too. What we ran into that was a bit of a challenge was her parents were separated, and when the dad had her in his custody because i was the caregiver i was at, after the dispensary part there when we couldn't afford that or get enough from them i started being her grower now mom was primary caregiver i was the second uh that left him breaking the law if he was to administer medicine so i had to turn over my uh caregiver license to him so he wouldn't be breaking the law giving his kid medicine um, so that was one of our more stressful parts of that whole thing was not being able to have enough of us be a caregiver in order to legally provide her with what was what is pretty much coming out as being the protocols that are working for that stuff. I I think I heard that. But can I just ask specifically? Um, mm -hmm. are the are the plant counts? Um, you know, is has that led to some uh, bad consequences for you? We didn't have, I wouldn't say bad consequences. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at growing. Um, I know a lot of people who aren't that, that grow much more, much less than I was able to. Um, so 
I was able to keep up with her need, but had I had a mold issue, a powdery mildew issue, any bugs come in there, if I wasn't able to keep a turnover from the vegging plants to the flowering plants, any of that being out of step would have led to a shortcoming that the dispensary wouldn't have been able to make up for because they're uh, restricted in how much they can provide to a patient per month. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, Pepper kind of beat me to the punch on my question. We've we've heard um, we've heard a couple folks kind of give us suggestions on raising the mature and immature uh, plant count. You know, mm -hmm. I think we've heard that from the dispensary side, the the the, the patient side, and the and the caregiver side. And I was going to ask what you thought. You know, and I know there are states out west that uh, I think the highest we've heard so far is. 12, Amelia could probably correct me if I'm wrong on what she was, or no, two, no, 12 and then no immature plant cap. I know that there's some states out west that have like four times that amount, uh, up near 50 plants. I'm mm -hmm. sure Jesslyn could correct me if I'm, I'm wrong there when she's going to speak with us here soon. But I'm wondering, and, I, and my question was going to be geared around um, or centered around your, your patient. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're a, you're a, a self-proclaimed great great grower and that's that's mm -hmm. awesome but for folks that might be caregiving for somebody you know under similar cir unfortunate circumstances what and i know it can be hard to ballpark a specific number but um i guess that's an oxymoron but when we're, when we're talking about numbers and if we're interested in raising these numbers what would be a mm -hmm. good number given the fact that everybody's a different um stages of their ability to grow some, you know, like to experiment a little bit more than mm -hmm. others until they find what really works for them. So what would be, if you don't mind me asking some, some good numbers from your perspective? I would think probably what most of the surrounding states and other not surrounding states are doing where it's six to 12 based on either household. If there's uh, two adults in the household, they can do 12 flower and plants. If there's one, you can do six. Um, I think because other states are all doing that without huge repercussions, negative things from that, um, that there's not a reason we couldn't also do that. I don't think it's going to lead to a, a huge black market or underground market, I should say, um, kind of thing, because most people who are going to do that, it's going to be for the medical reasons and not some other. And other states are also doing the same. Connecticut just passed that. New York just passed that. Um, so I think that's a safe number to go with, but anything would have been good. I did mention we had some family members supplement some material for us when we couldn't get it elsewhere. So that in my growing time, you know, from going from dispensary to grower, we did have help from that. Um, so having more plants would have allowed me a less veg time. So less time that I would have had to do that. I had to vegetate my plants huge in order to get a good harvest out of two plants. And that took months to do. Whereas you don't have to have that long time for vegetative growth if you don't have those restrictions. Great. Great. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the caregivers? I think the recommendation we've heard so far is three for, for a child under 18 or 21 and, I, and I'm wondering um, if you think that that's enough I mean it sounds like that could be you know someone who is you know growing for the child plus a, two parents mm -hmm. um, but I thinking of just even my own experience raising two children without serious medical issues how many people were involved in just administering regular antibiotics could have been a grandparent could have been mom dad step is three does three cover the care for a child? Or could there possibly be a way that that child or person having the card means that whoever's administering the medicine because that child has their license that that's okay, that, that we're not so much worried about who's administering it. If the people who are the caregivers are okay with that person giving it, then it's more based on the patient having a license so that it's okay. And what kind of information do parents get if they're if they're embarking on this for their child? What kind of information about medical cannabis do they typically get? That's very tough because you have to pretty much chase down whatever information. Um, dispensaries are probably leading.
legally and somewhat morally held back from stating anything definitive because it's not laid out that definitively. Um, there's studies you have to read through and find things that seem to work in those studies, which are largely animal studies. There's some human studies, um, but you have to pretty much chase that down. Uh, the dispensary is very good with trying to work with what you have come to determine is going to work best for you um, and trying to make up whatever you need. But at the same time, they're kind of limited in, in what they can suggest you do because they're selling a product at the end of it. Okay, thank you. Well, Eric, kind of on, on, this, on this topic, I'm wondering if somewhere down the road, you know, next year um, or thereafter, after the, the, the medical program actually is under the purview of the, the Cannabis Control Board, uh, would folks, you know, uh, families, would they find – um, value in some type of education outreach coordinator or that being a responsibility of somebody in uh, at the state level in the medical program to really engage with those families. Uh, I understand that, you know, people have a lot of thoughts about uh, state government and, and, you know, X, Y, and Z. So just wondering if that's something that might be of value to, to folks in this situation. I think it'd be extremely valuable. Um, I have a store somewhat like Meredith has, and I talk to a lot of people who come in. Some have done the medical program. Some have gone to recreational states and tried to have at it themselves. And there's a lot of stories of people ending up in the emergency room thinking they're dying from overdoing it. Um, I had an 81-year-old lady who got her medical card in Vermont and got some oil, and uh, she ended up in the emergency room having a panic attack at 2 in the morning thought she was going to die. Um, so I, a couple weeks ago, talked to someone who went to Colorado, got two 100 milligram cookies for him and his wife in Estes National Park. And by the end of the night, they were $11,000 in the hole from their two ambulance rides from Estes to the emergency room. Um, so I think education to anything dosage related, type of intake, what you're taking, I think that to have something for that would be extremely helpful. Great, thank you. Eric, uh, we're all kind of circling the same question, um, but could you maybe just describe what your early experience was like at calibrating that kind of right cannabinoid profile and that right kind of product for your patient? I mean, it's it's in the absence of real medical advice, a real solid medical research. I've kind of jokingly said, I'm glad I wasn't on Facebook when it happened. I hadn't really dove into that yet because there's so much misinformation out there and there's a lot of decent information, but Facebook was a cauldron for all of it. And we started pretty much going through uh, legitimate studies that we would Google versus what people were saying in public groups like Reddit and Facebook. Um, so that that early phase was very slow because we were going very low dose with her. We had the dispensary. They were good for us. Um, so our early progress was a, a pretty smooth one. It was, uh, say, eight months before she had it was probably six months when the first tumor was pretty much gone, which for the type of cancer she had was pretty amazing. Um, so then when the second round of them with the seven tumors came back, we had already had that ramp up that takes most people about one to three months. We had six to eight months to do that. So that gave us a decent time to kind of go from just cannabis and a little bit of lifestyle change to the whole very high cannabis amounts and entire lifestyle change. Um, pretty much everything she ate was changed. What she had on for aromas was changed. Um, so it was probably a little better for us than an adult who comes out of the hospital with the diagnosis that she had and tries to go full bore at once. We, we were lucky enough in kind of a weird way to say that because it dragged out for a while. But in retrospect, we were lucky that we had that little bit of buffer where we went low dose and before going to the higher doses. Yeah. And I hope, I don't mean to have this be a provocative question, but I'm just curious, was your patient um, 
prescribe opiates at all? Yes, and some of the some of the um, some of what I tracked down there was the medical cannabis institute.com that did courses that give nurses continuing ed credits and it's specifically in cannabis medicine and through that they had studies where when you combine cannabis with opioids the amount you could reduce the opioid dose and still get the same relief level and it was between 60 and 95 percent depending on which opioids they were that you could reduce the amount adding cannabis and still get the same level um, so that was a big help because mom would then give less and uh, she she didn't want to give her kid a bunch of opioids. So she would either give a lot less because of that or none at all. Yeah. Wow. Um, Similar with other medicines, too. There's some anti-seizure medicines that um, it turns out with indica strains, a lot of people re re uh, report getting rage. Um there was a term for it related to the type of seizure medicine that it was. So she was able to keep an eye on that and try to offset when the seizure medicine was given and when the cannabis was. It's uh, it really is an incredible story. And I, and I mean that as in, it just touches on all of the issues that we've been focused on today. And so mm -hmm. I really appreciate all of the help you've given your patient and all the help you're giving us here today. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning a lot of people when I get into this conversation and mention it um, are wondering how she is now. And she's great. She's been three years without any signs in her her um, her scans and stuff. So uh, cancer free still. It's been a five year battle at this point, but it was two years of uh, dealing with the tumors. And now we've been at three years of her uh, not having cannabinoids in her. Um, and still having some of those lifestyle changes on what she eats and stuff. Um, but she's three years with uh, clear scans and happy and just like any other kid her age. That's incredible. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's so great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, that is. That's, 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 we didn't want anything other than that. And we were all pretty hell bent on doing whatever we could to keep anything else from being the case. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, Julie, any other questions for Eric? No, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to. Yeah, likewise. No, no further questions right now, but I appreciate you coming and sharing your, your story and your perspectives with us. Well, I thank you guys, too, for the work you're doing. And without the program, I don't know where we would have been, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, next on our list is... Oops, sorry. Next on our list is Jesse Lynn Dolan. Je Jesse Lynn, are you with us? I am. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. I don't think my camera's on, but that's okay. No, we see um, you. We see you too. Oh, okay, great. Great. All right. Well, hi. Um, so thanks for having me here today. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of both medical patients and professionals, really. Um, my name is Jessie Lynn. I'm an opioid research nurse at UVM. I specialize in multi-substance use and mental health disorders. I used to manage Lund. I've worked labor and delivery, and I co-founded UVM's Labor Doula program. Um, I'm also vice president of American Nurse Association, so I have helped represent a lot of nurses statewide for Vermont, and I'm on the SANE, the Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner's Advisory Board. Um, but I'm also a medical cannabis patient myself. I'm a chronic pain patient. I've had about 40 surgeries um, due to both childhood car accident and a genetic disorder, the same genetic incurable connective tissue order that Amelia has, which affects my organs and joints and has also led to multiple surgeries. So again, I've had over 40 surgeries. I have titanium rods plus human cow, pig, stem cells, all kinds of stuff, holding my face and my fake teeth together so I can actually speak to you today. So between all my personal and professional lives, I take anything having to do with medication and patient care really seriously. I've tried more medications than I can name, experienced more fair share of negative um, reactions, side effects. I've also administered dozens and dozens of pharmaceuticals to patients and watched them go through the same. Without cannabis, personally, I would easily be on multiple pharmaceuticals um, with a much lower quality of life. 
So, because I'm a research nurse, I'm also a single parent of adults and teenagers. I have parents in recovery from alcohol and addiction. I've spent decades as a nurse working with addiction. And myself personally, I don't say this often, but I have two and a half decades sober myself. Um, I, so I don't make the decision to use or support cannabis consumption lightly, personally or professionally. For many years, I've been a cultivating cannabis patient and caregiver cultivating for another nurse in cancer remission. I actually started out purchasing and wanting to purchase from the dispensary, but I couldn't afford the medicine on my nursing salary and my medical needs. I was also surprised at the poor quality of the medical dispensary. I know people have discussed reasons patients aren't signing up to get their card, but I really think quality is the number one issue for me beyond that um, absorbent expense, which made it not an option. So I decided I needed to grow my own. I wanted cleaner and better cannabis, but I also realized that the dispensary staff weren't medical professionals. So I was going to a medical facility that couldn't give me the medical knowledge that I needed to be supported. So obviously I recognized there was an urgent need for cannabis education, right? For myself, for others. So I dove in, I started taking as many classes as I could find on cannabis. I started the Vermont Cannabis Nurses Association specifically to help educate medical professionals and patients. I now serve on the board of the American Cannabis Nurse Association and together the American Nurse Association Vermont, so the Vermont nurses and um, We've, we've acknowledged this, we understand this. So we've created an education program for medical professionals in Vermont with the Vermont Cannabis Nurse Association, a virtual um, cannabis ed curriculum to help bridge this big knowledge gap. But that's, that might not be enough, right? If we don't actually have medical patients and medical professionals overseeing and changing the medical program, so again, I appreciate you listening to us and being open to making a lot of the changes that we really need to see to improve our program. Um, first off is the funds. Amelia mentioned this before. We need that to stay protected. This isn't some kind of fiscal territoriality, right? There are real patient and programmatic needs that money can reduce annual patient fees, increase the delivery so we have more rural patient access, cover lab testing costs, to help ensure consumer protection. When we heard about the dispensaries before talking about lab testing, that's just testing for THC and CBD. We don't test for contaminants in this state. So I don't know if my medicine that I'm buying from a dispensary has mold or mildew in it, and that could make me or another patient much sicker. So if we had those funds, maybe we could lab test and cover that expense to ensure clean cat cannabis. And then we've heard over and over education, that money could create a fantastic education program, which I think we all know could absolutely be done better. Um, so a couple things I'll propose, you know, I propose creating a standardized mandatory statewide education program for medical and adult use staff and the medical patients. Right now we have five dispensaries. They create their own education and it's not working. I hear repeatedly from patients and other medical and cannabis industry professionals, there's a serious lack of education and support amongst the dispensary staff. So I know they mentioned before they have continuing ed, but who do they have qualified to give them that continuing education? And as the adult market opens up, um, we're gonna start to have retail outlets all over the state, but they're gonna be under informed staff kind of left in the dark. So this could get worse. The reality, um, what we've heard people say before is that all consumers are patients. 70% of Americans are on pharmaceuticals. So we have to accept that a lot of people who will use adult use dispensary will be on meds. So they are a patient, they just might not have a med card. Why? They're a veteran, they're worried about losing their benefits. They're a nurse like me and I was very nervous for years to put my name on a dispensary where my professional license could be questioned. Um, single parents might be concerned they're putting their name in a system where they still have stigma that can be leveraged against them. What about gun rights? So there's a lot of good reasons people might be patients but might, might not be on the registry besides accessibility, affordability, quality of product. So uh, we really do need this education, continuing education for staff because this is fast paced and this is rapidly changing the industry. As a nurse, I'm constantly reading and trying to keep up. So I can't imagine 
five different medical dispensaries having five medical professionals educated enough to be doing this continuing education. I would love to see harm reduction, microdosing, helping efficacy to help costs, learning and teaching people how to choose that best strain. The dispensaries often don't have enough options of different strains or necessarily the education to help that patient. Um, understanding medication interactions is a really big one. As I said, seven out of 10 people are on pharmaceuticals and then having the right referrals. So substance use disorder referrals and mental health support referrals and being that conduit in a way. Um, so really every bud tender across the state, medical or adult should have education. I feel very, very strongly about that. Um, and we know that money that we lost in 2017 and the current cannabis control or cannabis um, fund could put a medical professional one day a week or more in every medical dispensary across our state and let Vermont set a national example and do it right by actually having medical professionals and education for medical patient support. Um, another quick problem that needs to be fixed, no one's mentioned yet, is I hear from patients and caregivers who their cards have lapsed and expired because of the systematic approach. So I would love to recommend and see a better approach systematically, not just maybe an email or did you sign up for the email system? I've lapsed a card, I've lapsed a caregiver card. I just yesterday donated cannabis to a patient who her card lapsed. She can't see her doctor till July. It'll take a few weeks to get the paperwork. So somehow that's just a little logistical thing that I think as we move forward, we can do better with that. Um, we also need to help patients financially. Cannabis is really expensive. I'm a nurse. I make a decent salary, but I'm a single mom. I couldn't afford. That's why I started to grow for my own. So we need to help support patients through that caregiving process for financial reasons outside of the retail dispensary. So basically, medical cannabis is an issue of social justice, right? Um, so with that being said, speaking of social justice, thank you to Vermont Growers, Trace, No for Rural Vermont, Racial Justice Alliance, the people who really have been pushing to make a social equity program better in Vermont for females and felons. Um, so I'm grateful to them. So cost wise, I can go pay a dollar to go pick up opioids. I don't have to wait three months for my doctor to write me a prescription for Xanax compared to plant medicine. So this is not only why I donate, this is why I grow. This is also why I've attended almost every symptom relief oversight committee for the last few years to try to have this voice. Um, but that committee is often the, the voice of patients who can afford to use the medical dispensaries and the dispensaries appoint those patients themselves. So I just want that to be noted that, that I, and I know hopefully moving forward, we will see that adjusted a bit, that the current makeup of that committee does not represent the patients who are unable to afford and afford and have the privilege of using the dispensary. So with that being said, um, one of my requests is to add some people to the symptom relief oversight committee. Right now it's a patient from every dispensary. I'd ask that they continue to use, um, appoint a nurse and a doctor, but the nurse I would love to see appointed by the American Nurse Association, Vermont. As of right now, it's governed and appointed. a and Vermont, starting the statewide education program, does have a good pool to suggest nurses from, and we are written into statute for many other, other committees, and this is what we do. We basically vet and see who is the best person to put forward. I'd like to see a naturopath on the board. Naturopaths are verifiers for cards more than the Vermont Medical Society, from my understanding, and are supportively and have a different understanding of natural medicine. So the dispensaries even mention that the Vermont Medical Society pushes back on them. Having a naturopath on the board, I think, would be a really good fit. I'd also ask to put a cultivating patient and a caregiver on the board. And I'd suggest that the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition appoint that. That's the, that's the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, VGA, Royal Vermont, and NOFA. And we need someone, I think, from the Agency of Agriculture's hemp program to appoint either someone for cultivation or lab science. So really to have more of a voice than just the patients that utilize the dispensary system. So that's one of my big suggestions and requests. We need experts on the public board service um, that have understanding about utilities, right? So we need medical cannabis professionals and patients as guides on these boards. 
With that being said, for the Cannabis Control Board Advisory Board itself, I'd also like to see them expand to a 15th person and not just have the chair designate the Symptom Relief, Relief Oversight Committee, but two positions to make sure they have both a medical professional and a patient representative. Um, so there's one, um, you know, because as I've mentioned, my concern is just having that one person appointed and that they might have the financial privilege to use the dispensaries compared to other folks. And that wouldn't represent my voice by any means. So, um, so a few of the hopefully legislative and bigger changes I see is really reiterating some of the great testimony we've heard today. That three month relationship for a patient is silly. Like I said, I don't need to wait three months to get a Xanax or a Percocet. Um, the definition of a debilitating medical condition is very limiting in Vermont. We have probably the most, you know, tightest program here. I think it comes down to, again, education. We need to trust our medical professionals to be able to say, yes, it makes sense for this person to utilize medical cannabis, right? Um, getting rid of having to reapply every year. Even my doctor thinks it's kind of silly every year. Oh, I got to write again that you have the same degenerative debilitating condition every year. Um, increasing a patient's possession limit from two to 12 plants. And I want to give an example as to here's why. So one plant gives on average a grower maybe three ounces or so. I need 16 ounces to make one initial treatment of what Eric mentioned before, that Ricky Simpson or that FICO treatment. That's just the initial treatment. That's two months. To get 16 ounces, I have to grow six harvests. So that's going to take me eight months to get two months worth of medicine. So just a quick example to understand why that plant count at two is so silly and we really need to adjust that. Last winter, I was scheduled for a lumpectomy for a breast tumor removal, and I accidentally destroyed 16 ounces of flour, making my own eight months worth of harvested medicine right before I needed it for post-surgical pain relief. So even somebody like myself who has been do doing it a while, I did it wrong, and that was a big loss and a big concern for me. And if I didn't have such limited plant counts, I probably wouldn't have had I guess that been such an issue. Mistakes happen, plants die, they get sick, they get diseases, you burn the FICO or the brownies, right? Sometimes you grow something and that strain doesn't work for you at all. The dispensaries have a limited strain selection. It's taken me years to go through strain after strain and I only have so much, so many plants I can have so it takes me a while to say, oh, it's taken me six months and now I know that plant doesn't work for me. It's taken me years to find one medication that helps me for my migraines. But interestingly enough, it only helps when it's grown outdoor and not indoor. So with my minimal plant count, I have to try to take that one strain and grow enough outdoor for the entire year because that's the only medication I can use for my migraines. Um, so speaking of, I guess, the dispensaries, if we're making an accessible market, which is what we really want to do, I think we have that moral and ethical obligation to also craft a more supportive, affordable medical program that puts patients over profits, right? So we have to allow patients and caregivers to purchase from any red, from any dispensary, adult use, not just any medical dispensary, without paying the extra taxes. Or we should look at medical dispensaries being nonprofit so that they can serve patients. It's patients over profits. Um, currently, they can profit on both, regardless of what they say. We know there's a risk of them not having enough medicine for their patients because we already see them struggling to have enough quality medicine and enough options and different strains for patients. So, um, I also encourage you to look at unlimited veg immature plant, plant counts for many reasons. Cultivators can explain. In the same light, I'd like to see a larger outdoor plant count, as I mentioned before, if we're going to include that for adult use, if they can cultivate so much indoor and more outdoor, let's also afford that to medical patients as well. What if I can't grow for a season or a harvest? What if I have two plants die? What if I, um, you know, have to cut my plants down and I want people to be able to cut their plants down instead of try to salvage a sick or a plant that has bugs or diseases, something like that. So for a little regional perspective, Maine's cultivating caregiver 
and New York is what we should look for. New York's cultivating caregiver programs, um, I'm sorry, Maine's cultivating caregiver program is much more substantial and really something we can look at for success. New, New York allows five patients to have to be caregived for at the same time. Massachusetts, you get 12 plants. So our counts are so minimal and so low and extremely fear-based and basically putting burden on patients. Um, the next burden is the, the fingerprints. I've been a caregiver for years. I've never had to get fingerprinted for that. I've gotten fingerprinted for many jobs as a nurse. I have to schedule it. I have to pay for it. I have to take time out of my schedule. I have to find the right officer in the right place. It's just a burden. And if we're talking social equity, this is the absolute opposite of, of pushing that social equity forward. Um, Couple more things I'll quickly wanna say. Caregivers, I like to look at having up to five caregivers, especially for pediatrics. When you look at either pediatric seizures or end of life, you're administering medication often. You need four and a half people so that one of those caregivers is not working over 40 hours a week. And I do foresee in the next five to 10 years, end of life is going to be much more cannabis medication. So I'd like to see us working towards this now instead of every year just having to change the you know change legislator and go back to making bills Recipro reciprocity bleh, sorry reciprocity makes sense we've had a few people mention that lastly i think you guys have heard over and over the thc caps and removing those as i've mentioned most and many adults who use cannabis are using cannabis medicinally whether they're registered patients or consumer patients so we need to give them the options more importantly, they'd like to have possibly geographically closer dispensaries, more product options, and maybe support small businesses rather than large scale for profit medical corporate cannabis. So it comes down to that access, that affordability and the quality. So I know I've mentioned a lot, pretty much everything I've reiterated, probably what other people have spoken before. So I appreciate your time, your openness. I'm asking you to help us, help me, help patients and medical professionals be able to make this program that much better, which I know we can do. It's overdue, it's deserved. Um, and I think it will entice and give reasons for consumers to become patients and make that much bigger and more substantial and better of a program. So thank you again. You know, please feel free to ask any questions that you have and I'm always um, here to help and answer questions and do anything I can, you know, to move things forward. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse Lynn. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to talk fast to get it all in. No, so. I, you, and there was a lot to cover. Thank you for uh, being, for talking quickly because we are running a little short on time, but do we have questions for Jesse Lynn? Um, can I ask a question about employment, Jesse Lynn, just since you said this a couple of times about, you know, being a nurse and being on a on a medical registry list. Um, I had someone mention to me the other day that they're in the hiring process and will be drug tested as part of their hiring process. It's not for a CDL, so it's not necessarily like they're going to be driving or using heavy, heavy equipment. And they're worried about their employment, um, but they're a medical cannabis user and registered patient. So... Can you talk a little bit about what those barriers are for people and employment and medical cannabis? And what made me think about that was, you know, what kind of guidance should be given to employers about yeah. this program? Um, my guidance and coming from actually the American Cannabis Nurse Association just put out a position statement on this nationwide stating that if there's somebody that is on medical cannabis and they're more speaking to nurses because we have had nurses lose their professional licenses for testing THC positive, even though they've had medical cards. So what we what ACNA recommends is not testing a medical patient for THC or knowing that they're gonna test positive and that that's okay. But unfortunately, policy is different. And here in Vermont, we have a different policy at every hospital, at every institution. So you're really at the whim of that specific job. So one job might test them and they might not pass, but then the concern is, is that job gonna report them to the nursing board? So it's not only the concern of can I get that job, it's will this affect my nursing license in a different way? So I think it's a larger concern than just actually can I get that job? It's will my license be questioned? And licenses are questioned when you have a medical card. I can, I can tell you that personally. Um, I was very hesitant to get my card. It actually took my doctor a year or two to convince me 
to do it because of those concerns. And I called the nursing board and tried to talk to them about it. We have no stance in the state of Vermont specific to nurses. I am working on what's called a nursing position paper to make that stance. But professionally, I think we are kind of in limbo and in a gray area. So my suggestion to that person would be find out the institution's policy. Um, if they need to have somebody else, I've made cold calls for people or they don't want to call from their number or use their name to find out what the institution's policy is to see if it is a concern because it might not be a concern at all. Like one thing methadone patients in the state don't know is most of the methadone clinics here don't even test you for THC because they, they're not concerned about it. But if you go to a private prescribing doctor, they likely will test you for THC. So that's a different story. So you really need to know who tests for it, what are the repercussions as far as will they then you know, have any concerns. Most of the time, like you said, it's a concern on the job. And that's what the nursing board told me is there would never be a concern or question with me being a medical cannabis patient unless there became a concern reported for the work that I'm doing as a nurse, then they absolutely have the right to look and see what medication and what's affecting what. So I don't, so I hope that kind of answered your question, but moving forward, I do hope to see it more, if not a state stance, but a national stance that if you have a medically prescribed card, you absolutely can prescribe or can, you know, test positive, just like if you were medically prescribed Xanax or a barbiturate or an opioid, and you can prove you have that prescription, you are allowed to have that job and test positive for, you know, Percocet and still have your CDL as long as you have that prescription. Okay. Yes, it's an answer. Thank you. Hi, Jesslyn. Thank you so much. And a quick antidote on the on the subject of, of Julie's question. Um, my parents who live in Maryland have a, a good friend who is part of the Maryland medical program and was trying to go back to school to a community college and had scholarships lined up. And at the last minute, they yanked those scholarships from her because she was a medical patient and um, because that was disclosed. I'm not sure if it's because the community college has federal funding or the scholarships themselves were a federal stream, um, but it inhibited her ability to go back to school because she couldn't afford it without the scholarship. So uh, it's, a big, it's a big issue. And as we know, there are certain states, I know Florida at one point was testing people that needed to use the social service system for food stamps or housing assistance. They were actually testing people a couple years ago for THC, and you were not allowed to get that assistance if you tested positive. Yeah, and I know that under the previous administration at the national level, that was something that was being considered, um, just putting that out there, unfortunately. Um, I did have a question for you, Jocelyn, and it's something that I've, I've heard from you a, a couple times, um, and it's the it's it's the suggestion that if somebody has a medical card and they're at some place in the state of Vermont, they go into an adult use recreational dispensary and be able to kind of um, you know buy a product tax free or under the, the medical you know purview versus the adult use uh, program. And I know Julie had asked. Uh, Virginia about um, how if she had any knowledge about how Maine was doing that earlier and I know um, Meredith had kind of walked us through a little bit how Colorado does it and I'm familiar with that kind of setup where you walk into a building and depending on if you're a medical patient or, or not you kind of get shepherded through um, a different part of the building right um, I'm curious um, if, if there's any other jurisdictions around the country that allow for a medical patient to just walk into an adult use rec facility and kind of, you know, present their card in that way and, and allow them, you know, that kind of, um, you know, buying power to do so with, with under the medical tax free um, kind of concept or if that's something that's that could be unique to Vermont. I'm almost positive that's how Oregon does it. I don't know how every state does it, um, but I if it is something unique to Vermont, I think we could do it really well too. I kind of see it as when you go to the regular general store and they have the liquor store, you have two separate cash registers, if that's what it needs to be. I don't think it should necessarily be two separate rooms because I want patients to have access to any and all products and to have those options. Um, but I, I do think we can absolutely find a way to make that happen. And I, I hope the better we make this medical program, the more we will have pe people want to get their medical card and to be part of the medical system. I think we've had a lot of people over the years leave the medical program because there's just not a supportive reason to do so. I know I... 
I'm sometimes seen as somebody that's anti the dispensaries and I'm not by any means. If they were doing full panel lab testing, had quality product, and had the education behind them and affordable prices, I would be the biggest cheerleader in helping to sign people up left or right for the dispensary system. But right now, I can't say that when I don't know if that, that's affordable medicine. I know it's not clean medicine if they're not doing their lab testing. I've been growing cannabis a long time. I know how growing large scale, um, if you don't test your medicine, you know, not every time, but you'll get problems here and there if you're not checking it. So. I would love to see us really grow this program and make patients be excited to sign up and be proud of the Vermont program. Great, thank you. One more question, and I think it makes sense for you based off of, of your, your profession. And I'm wondering, let's say there is an opportunity in the future to open this medical program up to other uh, physical and mental ailments. And I'm thinking about um, recovery from opioid addiction and whether it's somebody that's leaving a rehab a rehabilitation facility um, and, you know, is looking for something to help them with that or somebody who's currently incarcerated for something and has an addiction while they're in a correctional facility and in lieu of using, you know, recovery drugs like Suboxone or whatever the case may be, they might be able to um, use a medical cannabis. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that and if you'd be willing to um, entertain me. Oh, I've got a lot of thoughts, but I'll try to make it quick because this is definitely my wheelhouse and probably one of the reasons I am such a supporter of cannabis medicine because I hate to say and be graphic, but I have done CPR on people and my patients that are overdosing, you know, pregnant people that are overdosing. I've, I'm the person that administered methadone to babies for years to withdraw them. So this is such a passionate topic for me. Um, one thing I would like to see in Vermont is that anyone who gets an opioid prescription automatically gets a medical card. That's how Pennsylvania does it. So we really can, as Eric mentioned, you can use less opioids when you're using cannabis. So this comes all comes back to the education. We need people to have the education. What we know is you use less opioids when you're using cannabis in conjunction. But we also know for not for every person with substance use disorder is cannabis right. So that's why we need the education. It's when within the substance use world, we always talk about what's better for you, abstinence, suboxone or methadone, and that you have to know the information to make the right choice. Same thing, cannabis is not gonna be the right thing for every person in recovery, but for many people in recovery, you can get off your opioids. You can help your withdrawal symptoms. You can you can be on Suboxone or Methadone, and maybe now you don't need to take Ambien too. You can use cannabis in the evening at night, or you can reduce your Suboxone dose. I've helped people use cannabis to slowly wean off Methadone or Suboxone or Percocets to not have such bad withdrawal symptoms. So I think in every way, absolutely, cannabis should always be an option alongside every opioid with the right medical support to know if that is the patient. And I'd say seven, eight, maybe even nine out of 10 times, I think cannabis in conjunction with, with opioids is the right decision. But I have had those patients who will look at me and say, I can't touch anything. The minute I feel a little bit, I'm gonna go right back to heroin or I'm gonna jump you know, right into my world. So that's why it's it takes that skill and education. And also I want every bud tender, even at the adult use dispensaries to have this info, because I guarantee you, we are going to have people go into adult use and say, oh yeah, I'm taking Percocets for my knee and I want to try this weed and this and that dab. And, you know, and just having that knowledge to say, hey, here's a phone number you could call. There are some states doing hotlines. There's a nurse hotline in Colorado that is getting raging reviews because a patient or staff at a dispensary can pick up the phone and say, hey, couple questions, can, can you help me? Or a text line. We, again, we, we have the unique opportunity to provide education like no other state has done because we have a small state and because we have a new market and because we have the cannabis control fund money sitting there to say, yay, here, let's start a program and educate people. So with Vermont being one of, I know we're not the highest now, but at one point we were the highest opioid, opioid epidemic overdose in the country. I think we, it is unethical for us to say, no, we are not going to make cannabis another option basically. So yes, please, please, anything we can do to substitute or support opioid use disorder, opioid prescriptions, um, even alcohol use disorder, you know, other addictions as well. Um, 
Absolutely. And if you guys ever want to sit down, I'll chat with you for hours specific. I have all the research I've presented on this. Yes, yes, please. I really love the idea of education for, for everyone, for retail and for uh, medical dispensaries. I'm also wondering how much um, endocannabinoid education is in a nursing license or do physicians get or do naturopaths get just in general in a medical education? Unfortunately, none. You have to seek out the education yourself. That's why we started this Vermont um, nursing program, because the national nurse statutes state that every nurse needs to know about cannabis, but it's not in anybody's nursing curriculum. So you have to seek it out for yourself. So yes, it is. There, it is there like a, we'll get there eventually. Are there like approved CLE type um, courses for nurses or physicians to use that will, you know, count towards your CLE count, depending on your, your license. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the one we're doing with the Vermont nurses gives you a couple hours. I work with another program. I think it gives you 12 CEUs, which is a much larger comprehensive program. There's several programs throughout the country. Some are UVM has ones. Um, UVMs is, I'd say pretty expensive compared to a lot of other programs. If you're looking at financial feasibility, I've taken UVMs. I've taken pretty much most every program out there or vetted it. Um, so yeah, there's a few programs. There's not a per se national standard or certification as in a lot of other certifications. You can kind of start it in your bedroom or the garage, right? And call it a certification. So there, you know, Tricome Institute has one. Several different colleges are now putting things out. There's cannabis coaching certificates. So you could choose one and go with it. Or I really like Meredith's suggestion of, I, I think it would take a little bit of, of work for sure, but I think Vermont could create their own program and do it really well. But as I mentioned before, my concern would be that one, um, does the medical dispensaries have the medical professionals to be doing this training or the continuing ed? And also in, in some ways, I think this medical training should come from someone and some place that is not attached to making financial gains. So the dispensary themselves maybe shouldn't be the ones educating their staff at a statewide level because of that financial gain possibility. Great, thank you. I know I got more questions, but we're running behind schedule, so I'll turn it. I'm done asking questions right now, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm sure Julie has a lot more too, but we, I recognize it's 1208. Yeah, th thank you, Jess Jesse Lynn. I mean, you've been an incredible resource for the board already, um, and we. Uh, and prior to the board's formation as well. So, but but thank you for your for your advocacy. Thank you for your help um, understanding these issues. Thank you for the kind of um, work you've been doing on the intersectionality with opiates. Um, but uh, and I'm sure we'll be working with you in the future. Um, I I would like to turn to public comment. Um, you know, our quorum rules will require at least. Uh, at least two of us to be here. I know we haven't had a break yet. So Julie or Kyle, if either of you want to step out for lunch, um, that's great. I can um, conduct the public comment, um, but I do see a few hands raised. So I'd like to do it. Um, for those with their hands raised, I'd like to just really limit your public comments to two minutes each. And um, we'll start with the people that have uh, joined via the link um, that have their hands raised. The first one that I see is Eric Reed. Eric, if you could unmute yourself, um, if you have a comment, um, great. Okay, am I on? We see you, we hear you. We hear you. Okay, uh, to what Meredith said, to what Eric said, to what Jesslyn said. Um, because of federal legalization, uh, I think your bud tender should minimum know the endocannabic system. Um, I too, uh, I will not do, uh, I won't do your medical registration anymore, um, just for all the reasons that they mentioned. Um, uh, I couldn't afford it, and you were talking minimum five thousand bucks a year. Uh, I took five grand, and I, um, I now have my own uh, ethanol processing lab. And what they're saying about it takes this much flour, right? There's a half a pound of flour to make a few tubes of FECO. And it just really, it, we, need, we need a higher plant count um, for sure. We absolutely have to have a higher plant count. 
Um, I think you guys are crazy if you don't get Jesslyn on somehow involved to put her in charge of some kind of curriculum to educate and, and have her um, or somebody like her, have her the one um, to educate people. I've learned more about the endocannabinoid system from her. And I went to a Lyme specialist uh, here in Vermont and I took the Igenix test. I took the Western blot test and I scored, I hit more markers than anybody she had ever seen. I was well over 200 pounds. Um, because of cannabis, I've lost close to 75 pounds. Uh, every day I do 100 push-ups, push chin-ups, sit-ups. Um, for three years now, I go to mental health counseling. Um, because of cannabis, my life has, and, and I've lost COVID, forget COVID. I've lost my dad. I've lost relationships. I've lost so much. And because of cannabis, hemp, and THC, um, I can get up every day, and I can be the most positive I've ever been. I get up at 4 or 5 in the morning, um, and I again, I, so here it is. I have light. Um, I have fire in me because of a plant. And the way that we are um, regulating it, uh, the way that we don't – because of federal regulation, because of the federal legalization, I watch what goes on in Israel and I watch what goes on in Canada. There's so much research. That's the key to that federal legalization. And once that's open, then you can answer a lot of those questions because doctors can't prescribe it. They can't, and they don't know. And with the cultivars, we we need research. We need scientific data. We need to know which ones, um, you know, put uh, send prostate cells into uh, apoptosis versus uh, the colon cells. So the bud tenders, I think we should just get them educated on the endocannabic system, learn about 2AG, learn about ondondamide. Eric, Eric thank, thank you. Thank you for the, the public comment. I, I really appreciate it. I think that's been a consistent theme that we've heard over and over and over again today. So so thank you for kind of you got it. Re, reinforcing that for us. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I totally agree that Federal legalization will open a lot of research doors to a lot of the institutions that, you know, the federal government has a partnership with. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, next on my list is Tito. Tito, if you could uh, just uh, unmute yourself and provide public comment. And please, if you can, keep it to two minutes. I'll let you know when that when that marker is. OK, for sure. I'll be quick. Um, so um, ever since I started down the road uh, for advocacy of Tax and Regulate, I've really uh, enjoyed trying to work with other business owners and, and people along the way. And so I feel compelled to talk about the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association that Virginia brought up uh, that was started by Champlain Valley Dispensary. Um, I went to these meetings and uh, it, w it started off great. It kind of felt like, oh, we're going to get everybody involved. And, um, and then the, the, the meetings kind of fizzled out and then um, since I'm a patient, I, as you know, I have to designate a dispensary as my personal dispensary. So I get their emails and I was surprised to see the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association still being touted in their emails as if it's uh, something that's inclusive. And it just, it feels extremely disingenuous to me. I reached out to them, um, through email multiple times. Nobody's ever answered me back. And, um, so I just, I felt compelled to talk about that because, um, I think we need to keep we need to keep things genuine as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else who joined via the link uh, the, um, want to provide uh, public comment? And if you do, please just raise your kind of virtual hand. All right. Does anyone who's on the phone um, want to provide public comment? And again, to unmute yourself, you hit star six. OK, um, well, we're going to take a break. Um, we're going to be back uh, at one o'clock in about 45 minutes. Um, we're going to be hearing from the chair of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, as well as the uh, physician appointed member of that committee who's in surgery right now and hopefully will be able to join us. Um, but uh, Nellie, if you could maybe just uh, for the next 45 minutes, throw up our away message and uh, you could pause the recording as well. And we'll all be back at one o'clock. 
Okay, uh, this is uh, James Pepper, Chair of the Cannabis Control Board. We're resuming our meeting. It's one o'clock. Um, we have uh, two witnesses on the agenda. I believe I saw both of them here. Um, uh, Dr. Joe uh, and uh, Jim, are you are you on the are you on the line? Could you turn your cameras on? Uh, if you have yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. And okay. I'm here as well. Well, let me give just a quick, if you don't mind, let me just give a quick orientation um, as to why I asked you all to, to join us today. So essentially, um, you know, we are, uh, the Cannabis Board is, is taking over the medical program on January 1st, 2022. And, um, you know, I think that the medical program, we've heard from a few witnesses today, feels like in some ways that it's been frozen in time since its inception with a few minor kind of adjustments over the years. But um, really, it seems to be kind of based in a coal memo mentality, which is, I think, it, an important, um, you know, it was important at the time. It's still important to this day about DOJ enforcement. But I do think that now um, that we're moving into a world of adult use cannabis in Vermont, I think it really makes a lot of sense for us as a board to reconsider some of the restrictions that exist in this program and really try and make sure that uh, we're achieving a patient-centric uh, medical program here in Vermont. And I think that what's interesting is that the, um, the legislature, I think, recognized the need to have a, um, a group like the Marijuana uh, for Symptom Release Over Oversight Committee to help advise them on, um, you know, changes to the system that needed to be made over time. And I think that your reports, which I have read, um, are incredibly instructive and uh, incredibly helpful in trying to achieve that patient-centric focus. Um, but, uh, you know, for one reason or another, there's competing priorities in the legislature. I'm not sure that you've gotten a lot the attention you deserve, but I think, again, this is a time, and they've directed you all to really rethink the membership of the Marijuana for Oversight um, Committee, uh, you know, solidify the relationship between your committee and the Cannabis Board, and think about how you can provide some good information to us um, to really help you be the conduit for patient voices in uh, through the cannabis board. And we can be kind of a, a megaphone for, for you all um, and the recommendations that you're making to us. So I'd like you guys to talk about whatever you would like to talk about. Um, but I think that some of the things that uh, we've discussed offline are um, how to be more patient centric, how to really focus on quality, affordability, and accessibility of the program. And um, talking about your kind of 2019 report, which I think, um, you know, really focused on those issues. And really anything else that you'd like to, like the board to know, um, keeping in mind that we do have a report back to the legislature on November 1st of this year, with some recommendations specifically around how to reconstitute and how to restructure um, the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight uh, Committee. So that I'll turn it over to you, Joe if, or Jim, if you want to start. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Pepper. Um, and I want to right from the start, uh, thank you all uh, for your support so far. And this morning's uh, testimony was was really uh, uh uh, enlightening. It's certainly the the type of uh, testimony and information we've uh, been receiving uh, for these many years and putting in our reports. Um, but it's clear that the Cannabis Control Board is interested uh, and incredibly supportive of uh, the medical program here in Vermont, and uh, that makes it an exciting time now. Um, because as, as we've seen, the, the medical program has been a little bit of the Wild West. So I'm gonna just quickly introduce myself and my colleague and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. Um, I'm Jim Romanoff. I've been the chair uh, of the uh, Symptom Relief for Oversight Committee uh, for this year. I've been on the committee for six years, I believe. 
I'm a registered patient, uh, was initially appointed by uh, Champlain Valley Dispensary. And uh, besides that, I've never spoken to them uh, about being on the uh, committee again. And uh, I also want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Joe McSherry. Joe, do you want to, uh, Joe is the prior chair, uh, give a brief introduction of yourself. Well, sure. I uh, was a chair from the inception, uh, but I have other responsibilities, and I really was looking forward to someone else being chair now, which is why Jim is. Um, basically, uh, I uh, come from a background of uh, physics at uh, 1965 from Harvard. I went to school and got an MD PhD in 1971 from Baylor. And then all sorts of other uh, degrees and specialties. I do clinical neurophysiology and quite by accident ended up in the legislature uh, as a doctor of the day with the Medical Society in 1980 when they were discussing a medical marijuana bill. And uh, they asked me as a doctor who was, just happened to be there, you know, what do you think of it? And I said, eh, I don't know. They were fine as far as I know. And I was uh, listed as testifying in favor of the medical marijuana bill. And all of that bill uh, passed and was signed by the governor. Nothing ever happened with it. And so when it came around in 2000, they were going to do this again. Uh, Virginia was uh, taking care of uh, Mark Tucci at the time, I think. And uh, so they asked me to, to uh, testify, potentially. And so I have kept track of the research since then uh, in cannabis. And it's you know very interesting. And uh, the, the board, uh, as Jim has said, has uh, gone through lots of things. I think we've always been very patient-centric, and uh, consequently, we haven't had a lot of input from, uh, and haven't had a lot of need for input from the security people and, and so on. But uh, that's how I happen to be here, uh, quite by accident, and I'm delighted to be participating, and I'm very grateful to the committee for, uh, the, that is the CCB, for uh, incorporating us uh, as you have. And I look forward to the better uh, pathway to bring information to the legislature by bringing it to you and um, having you the opportunity then to actually speak to the legislature with a voice that they'll hear. But I have lots of opinions, Thanks. lots of things, so we can get on with those after uh, Jim takes off now. Thank you, uh, Joe. Um, you know, I think the um, really amazing thing in listening to this morning's uh, witnesses, uh, you know, that are clear is, A, the uh, medical uh, marijuana program in Vermont has a very passionate and involved community of uh, both patients and caregivers, uh, as well as the dispensaries themselves that uh, are eager to participate in the discussion. Um, and our experience uh, on the Oversight Committee is that uh, people have been eager to participate in the discussion um, all along. The Oversight Committee, however, is really uh, in somewhat a relic of the beginning of the medical program in Vermont. Um, and uh, James is correct, I think, in, in pointing out its uh, existence in, in many ways because of the Cole Memo. Um, and I just want to um, draw people's attention to the statute that originally created uh, the Cannabis for Medical uh, Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. Um, it is Title 18 under the Vermont statutes and Chapter 86, uh, the Therapeutic Use of Cannabis. And then they created a subchapter uh, 002 in which they created uh, this oversight committee. And... The membership of the committee, uh, which initially was a registered patient from each dispensary, a nurse and a registered patient appointed by the governor, a physician appointed by the Vermont Medical Society, that's uh, Dr. Joe, um, and then also a, a member of the local zoning board appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, a, a member appointed by the Vermont Sheriff's Association, and uh, a representative of the Department of Public Safety. And just the fact that the medical program was in the Department of Public Safety is sort of is, uh, tells you uh, that it was started out uh, almost uh, 
protecting the, the public from uh, the medical program and the risks of uh, there being legal cannabis through the medical program. Um, half of the members are were from either public safety or, uh, uh, you know, uh, League of Towns, that type of thing. I think the concern was, did people want a dispensary in their community? Uh, was it going to be safe? And uh, over the years, as, as Joe pointed out, uh, there turned out to not be really uh, any uh, problems uh, in any major way that had to do with uh, public safety or uh, the cannabis getting from the medical program into the uh, uh, public stream of usage. And uh, a lot of the members who were from uh, law enforcement really stopped attending our meetings, I think, because it was really just patients and caregivers uh, talking about how to give patients the best access uh, to the best medical program that they could. Um, and the way that the committee was asked to originally report to the legislature uh, also said a lot about the the uh, the cold memo and the fact that the committee was was really uh, there in a big part for for uh, cover and public safety. But we were asked to report uh, at the beginning of January of each year uh, in writing to the legislature, and that's what we've done. Um, the committee was not really uh, given any other uh, uh, avenue to communicate to the legislature. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, a requirement for them to call anybody as a witness or anybody to testify. Um, and as a result, we often, the reports uh, are well-researched and well put together. Um, we did this mostly with the support of the Department of Public Safety who, uh, uh, manages uh, the registry currently and uh, facilitated this committee. And um, the Department of Public Safety, you know, has, has been a great partner, but uh, clearly, you know, sets the tone that public safety is more of the issue than somebody from the Department of Health or the Department of Human Services uh, being involved in, in the medical program. But clearly the times have changed uh, medical marijuana is uh, legal in the majority of states. Uh, uh, recreational uh, cannabis is now uh, uh, legal in a huge number of states all throughout the Northeast. Um, and so with the, the changes really in the prevailing uh, 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 attitude about medical marijuana, I think uh, we've realized on this committee that there also needs to be changes uh, made to what this committee looks like, how it's made up, and how it reports to uh, the new Cannabis Control Board. And as the laws were uh, being made to create the recreational marketplace on the committee, we were concerned that uh, uh, the amount of money that was potentially uh, there for both the dispensaries that were in business now uh, and for any businesses that were going to get involved would really uh, drive the conversation uh, uh, in terms of how the new law was created and what the medical uh, program would look like under that. We even heard uh, anecdotal stories of legislators saying, you know, if you have recreational, why do you even need to have a medical program? Anybody can just go uh, buy uh, uh, marijuana at that point, um, which really tells you sort of the, the lack of understanding in the legislature of, of what the medical marijuana program is. Um, but also from the side of the, the oversight committee, uh, the lack of our ability to really communicate to the legislature other than in that report. We didn't really have any mandate to uh, be activists about it and uh, show up. And when the laws started uh, uh, getting created for recreational, uh, it became clear that the dispensaries did have a, a great, uh, you know, lobbyists working for them. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the fact that the law did get passed uh, two years ago without uh, anything written in for oversight of the medical program, it says at least something uh, about, you know, whether or not 
uh, patients and caregivers needed or do still need their own uh, advocacy uh, in this program. Um, at the beginning of our, our uh, session this year, uh, we took a survey of the, of the reality that the law had been passed and uh, read through it and realizing that there, uh, the oversight committee would end uh, in uh, March of 2022, I believe, when the uh, certain parts of the new laws kicked in, we decided the best thing that we could do was deliver our 2019 report, which had been delayed because of the pandemic, but also start to make a strong case for uh, the oversight committee or some form of oversight uh, being included in the advisory uh, panel for the new Cannabis Control Board. And we're gratified that so quickly the law was uh, updated this year um, with S25 and that uh, we are now very excited to be at the edge of uh, the opportunity to uh, look at what uh, oversight should and will look like in the future, um, make recommendations to the Cannabis Control Board uh, our plan is to do that uh, by the end of the summer to give you time uh, to uh, go through it and uh, ask us questions and uh, make updates as you see needed before getting it to the legislature. Um, this morning, you know, as I said, was a great, uh, uh, I think, you know, case for why oversight is, is really needed. All the issues that were brought up of uh, affordability, uh, you know, t types of conditions that qualify for the medical program, uh, limits, laboratory testing, uh, you know, uh, everything, including, you know, use of excess funding from the medical program are issues that we have uh, dealt with and that are, are uh, coming up uh, constantly. And uh, yet it is neither probably a, a wise thing for the dispensaries uh, to monitor themselves. And in looking at the makeup of the advisory panel to the Cannabis Control Board, there really uh, clearly seemed to be a need for, at the very least, uh, oversight of the program, but also hopefully um, more than that. Uh, this morning also pointed out that we're at the beginning of a very exciting time where the prevailing attitude in the country is one of uh, not only legalized recreational use, but a way more serious approach uh, to the number of medical marijuana programs that there are and how they're funded and how they exist within the federal tax codes and other federal laws. So, you know, it would seem that we're at the, at the beginning of uh, changes that will be happening where uh, the idea of things like insurance uh, might be a bit down the road. There are states that already do have grants available uh, through their own uh, uh, coffers. Um, there will be all kinds of, uh, I think, issues brought up as more research is done uh, as to, you know, what uh, the appropriate ways for the FDA to speak about uh, medical marijuana will be. And then that will in, in turn uh, make things like insurance and uh, medical practitioners more comfortable education that people talked about this morning is a huge problem. Uh, there is not a, uh, a unified, uh, solid uh, uh, training program for uh, bud tenders, for people that work at medical dispensaries. And uh, the same standard of care needs to be created for medical patients that exists for medicine, regular medicine, naturopathic medicine, in terms of the types of medicine that are prescribed and the types of advice and treatment they get. So all of these things are things that the oversight committee in the future should be able to uh, uh, look at, speak with the public, uh, get input from caregivers, from patients, and also hopefully be looking at our neighbors throughout the country, see how other medical programs are operating, and uh, make uh, recommendations to the Cannabis Control Board about how to proceed. I think it's really true that we have a good medical program now. It is not the best program in the country, uh, you know, but Vermont is, uh, is if anything, excels at uh, wanting to be at the vanguard of things. 
And there's no reason that our state should not be a model for how uh, a medical cannabis program should go, how new research is uh, vetted and accepted. And, uh, you know, I, I sense that uh, the people on the Cannabis Control Board, that you all are excited about that opportunity. But I also hear from people in the community uh, that they're excited. So what we need to do is create a, an oversight committee uh, that is new and different and that can function in the right way in the future. And we need to look at all these issues as, as to whether uh, we still need to uh, incorporate public safety uh, into uh, oversight, uh, the League of Towns, whether those things are covered in other areas of your advisory panel. Um, so those are all things we will be holding meetings this summer uh, and looking at. Uh, hopefully within the next two or three weeks, we'll have our first meeting to get public input uh, and discuss with the board, um, you know, how we're going to go about uh, uh, aggregating and pulling everything together uh, to make our recommendation. And, you know, I'd like to say that I don't want to ignore all the issues that came up this morning. Um, I think myself and Joe would be happy to talk about any of them. Uh, I, all of them were in our 2019 report. Um, and I'd be happy to go through them. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, reciprocity and possession limits. And uh, but I really do think it's more important uh, that we get the opportunity uh, to talk with the board about the future of the oversight committee itself and get the nuts and bolts uh, out of the way so that we can uh, get back into the business of uh, being a, a clearinghouse for oversight and uh, and good medical information. And that will be one of the big challenges, as people pointed out this morning, um, medical information, um, that uh, there's not been public funding uh, for a lot of research done on humans. Uh, the medical industry doctors are not comfortable. Uh, in my experience as a patient, I've had a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic surgeon just stare at me blankly uh, uh, when I tell them that uh, cannabis has been part of my treatment, and yet all the nurses and surgical nurses know that I've been able to use less opioids by uh, using cannabis. So it's education, and it's and it's uh, good education from trusted sources, and that will be a, a challenge, uh, I think. And I, I was hoping Dr. Joe uh, could speak a little bit as our, uh, as our medical uh, representative uh, on the Oversight Committee uh, about the challenges of even getting a medical appointee to the board. Who would be the, the advising body that we would go to that would be, we want somebody that believes in the use of uh, cannabis as a medical therapeutic uh, treatment. And uh, uh, Joe, do you want to jump in here? Oh, sure. Um, I have lots to say about lots of things. And the first thing that uh, I would love for the board to do for us is change the name to the Medical Cannabis Oversight Committee. It was called Symptom Relief because they didn't want to call it medical marijuana. And marijuana is a uh, term that applies to something that I don't know what is. Cannabis is a well-known uh, plant. And uh, its use in medicine is really ancient, 7,000 years or so. So I uh, would hope that you can consider that. Uh, and I would, uh, I'm also uh, agreeing with uh, the idea of less emphasis on the enforcement and vendors and more emphasis on the research uh, based testing and the symptoms. And uh, yeah, that's, those are the things that I, you know, I'm particularly interested in. And to sort of illustrate uh, the diversity of products that are needed. Uh, there is a course at UVM, and I think it's the first course in medical school uh, since 1941, that uh, deals with cannabis uh, and its uh, function. And, and part of that, I did, made a little spreadsheet up that showed all the terpenes and terpenoids, as well as the cannabinoids, and what they're thought to do. So if you have somebody who's taking pain medicine, for instance, they have to take it in the morning, they have to take it in the evening, they're going to need two different kinds of cannabis because uh, cannabinol and linalool 
sedate the patient. That's good for bedtime, but pinene and limonene are alerting and energizing. And so you want to have a uh, chemovar, I think they call them now, and be able to choose those, and preferably with the knowledge of what you're doing, which brings me back to my interest in research, and that is uh, if we could find out from the patients what they're using and know what the uh, chemical composition of that was and what it helped, we could begin to put together more research than is available in the world right now. Although people have been studying this uh, in Canada and stuff, and there are programs for doctors and things to learn about cannabis in the Canadian uh, Cannabis Society. Um, so the, the need for testing and regulation, I, I actually, <laughs> in 2001, I suggested the Medical Society uh, go on record favoring uh, cannabis for medical purposes. And another resolution that I offered uh, was as a public health issue to make it legal for everyone, because at the time you're still buying stuff off the street, this marijuana, which you have no idea what it is. Uh, and that's still kind of what you're getting as long as it's not tested by a third party um, tester. And there are people apparently in the state who do that that is test for all the terpenes, terpenoids, uh, heavy metals, which are a toxin, obviously other things that the um, uh, pusher might have added for enhanced uh, excitement are things that you don't want in there. And so um, I'm really grateful, but I think it's, it's the recreational program that needs the testing as well as the medical program. That's uh, vital as a public health issue. Um, the uh, makeup of the board, oh, where we get that data, I've also, uh, uh, Jim and I have talked about, wouldn't it be nice if your board had a little chapter for patients to register their observations? Uh, and we could look at that and get an idea of what the patients actually want, because we do always have patients on the board and they can tell what they and the other people they know uh, have as a way of problems, like, you know, there's a mountain between me and where I can buy it. So you need some geographic distribution of the patients. And the um, getting, getting, getting a good collection of patients is difficult, but if they're all uh, depositing information on your website, that's great, and I can also then uh, send out a, a questionnaire on the website, for instance, listing all the uh, uh, cannabinoids and things like that. And I could fill out my uh, spreadsheet much more accurately in the future. And uh, that would be something that would be really helpful and would be the sort of thing that the bud tenders or practitioners could also reference. That is, they could know uh, if you have back pain and this, that, and the other, this one may be what we have a lot of, so that's good for you. That's not totally right. <laughs> um, much better for them to know that actually what you're going to need with these three things here, probably, and uh, try them out, start low, and um, build up gradually. Um, the affordability question is uh, interesting, and I hope there will be sliding scales, and then we can also in urge insurance coverage. Um, if everybody is covered by insurance, we wouldn't need to have the uh, Cannabis Control Committee subsidizing people. Um, and so increasing position, possession limits is another thing uh, which I just see. You should not make it more restrictive than recreational in terms of possession. Um, and again, the possession limits originally were set up when it was uh, worried that uh, everybody's going to have, uh, you know, Teenage kids were going to have back pain and want pot, and the doctor was going to say sure, and uh, then they might sell it to their friends. Um, I don't think that's real. Uh, and I think that in terms of the dispensaries, they are made, you know, I'm, uh, again, I have no financial interest in, in anything <laughs> except, you know, retirement funds, whatever they are. But um, if the patient could go to any to any place that was selling cannabis in the state with their card and they could run their card and they wouldn't have to pay taxes at that point, that would get them 
uh, in a good place. And it would also, I assume, the software would report back to us or somebody who's looking at how much the patient is using, lest they be doing that and going from uh, store to store and uh, selling it to their friends. But I think it would be something that could be monitored well, but I think it would be much more sensible in having people tied to a particular dispensary or a particular location because um, it's hard for people to get to them. And delivery, of course, is a great idea too, but it's gonna cost some extra stuff. Um, we've heard uh, about uh, increasing the patient to caregiver count, and that's uh, super with me, except that I remember originally the uh, caregivers were allowed to grow cannabis for their patient if the patient couldn't grow it. And if each patient has five caregivers, uh, that's about 70 plants. And if each caregiver has 10 patients and they can grow 10 plants per patient, that's 140 plants, which is getting into the small scale uh, grower category, I think, in terms of square footage and all. So I, I think that we will need to define better how what, what the caregivers and their responsibilities are. So uh, most caregivers, I assume, are just there to uh, get the patient their medicine in the middle of the school day. And I'm not sure you know, that, that that's illegal now, <laughs> but that's the sort of thing that we'd have to get the lawyers to tell us what you actually need in the way of a caregiver there. If it's a matter of supplying them with uh, cannabis that has been grown specifically for them, uh, that's great. Uh, but again, you need to have one caregiver per patient doing all that growing. And um, so anyway, I'd love to know more about the caregivers and how to stratify that. Uh, and then let's do it. Uh, in terms of the numbers of plants, uh, I, I don't know, but 14 doesn't seem unreasonable to me if you're actually starting out from seed because you're gonna not know 50% of them perhaps are gonna be uh, slaughtered when they uh, show their sexuality. And uh, you, you never get a 100% yield. Um, and if you grow them out with the sunlight, whether it's outside or in a grow room or something like that, that is uh, environmentally highly desirable. And uh, you gotta get your whole year's worth of cannabis in the ground and growing uh, so that by October, you're finishing up your harvest and you're good until the next October. Um, yeah. but those are the sorts of things we can work on for you. And I'd like to. And uh, other things, uh, there was this other category that uh, James sent around is anything else. And I wanna tell you, you gotta brace yourself for the elderly. They're the fastest growing body of users. And actually, the more they get the recreational exposure, the more uh, demand you're gonna have from them for medical because uh, old people have pain, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and dementia. And uh, cannabis helps with all those things in certain situations. So they're gonna wanna move uh, from recreational to medical. And uh, if you've got a very carefully defined uh, list of symptoms which are, are diseases that the patient has to have, uh, the elderly are gonna you know, want to expand that considerably. And a tantalizing area of ongoing research is uh, the effects on uh, addiction. Uh, so that it's well known as Jim has mentioned, uh, sorry, there are many articles uh, that people who use cannabis who've been using uh, opiates use less opiates for their pain, and maybe none at all. Uh, there's also uh, analyzing research on cocaine in rats, uh, rodents, um, where they uh, you, you can't get a, the rat to get uh, addicted if you give them uh, the, you know cannabidiol. And likewise, if they are addicted, they don't spend so much time pushing the lever for the cocaine if you give them the cannabidiol. Uh, opiates, as I say, that's mostly humans <laughs> that are our guinea pigs for that. And nicotine, it seems to have uh, a, an association with uh, reduced uh, nicotine use, which is a good thing also. Uh, but it's all association as opposed to causal. It is they don't have a good scientific uh, basis for why it interferes with uh, addiction yet but they do know an awful lot about addiction and I'm looking forward to being able to provide additional information on that, which brings us back to Jim's point about um, who do you want 
for your uh, medical and uh, perhaps botanical input. Uh, I think you need to vet people because, uh, as I say, I did propose in, in, in uh, 2001 that the Medical Society go on record favoring medical cannabis and medical for uh, uh, recreational cannabis. And that was not well received. And I've done that occasionally since then, and it's still not well received. Uh, a lot of doctors are like regular people, and they have opinions that are formed when they go to medical school, and they don't get changed after that, except by the drug uh, pushers who come around and give them lunch and, and uh, tell them about their specialized new medicine for headaches. So uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot that we can do and provide you, and the research is interpreted by people, and their bias comes through in their interpretation, and, and I think it probably came out in some of our annual reports that the Department of Health has particularly poor advice, and I just checked them out last week, and they still are using an article from 2012, uh, a study in New Zealand, and uh, the, the people who wrote that article were thoroughly uh, uh, mocked by the uh, other people in the research community, and eventually they rewrote the article. And so it moved from cannabis causes you to lose 10 IQ points after you're 21 years old to actually adverse childhood events is associated with poor outcomes uh, in your uh, younger adult life. Um, but the Department of Health is stuck with the 2012 one. You know, it's going to cause you to get stupid if you uh, use cannabis, um, which Turns out not to be correct. So um, the other things that were brought up, I think, were exempting PTSD diagnosis from physical exam. And that makes sense if a psychologist and psychiatrist makes a diagnosis. If I make it for myself, that may not be so good. Uh, exempting chronic conditions from annual provider forms. Yeah, people have a terminal disease, hospice, uh, in, in, they're in hospice, they have ALS or multiple sclerosis, they're going to have that for the rest of their lives, and you don't really need a, a medical recheck. But if you have uh, pain, like Jim, you got to check in with them every once in a while because they might actually get better, or PTSD, anxiety, sleep disorders. Those people may need some sort of uh, follow-up uh, to keep them in the medical program once they're there. Um, so... Is that enough talk for now? Thanks, Thanks. Jeff. Thank you, yeah, I'm Joe. trying to keep it short. <laughs> but I have lots of um, answers for any questions that are available. <laughs> yeah, and we, we at any point, uh, uh, please interrupt us for some questions. I, I, I would say one, one more quick thing uh, that I think is important to this discussion. Part of the challenge of the sheer volume of uh, input that the public, that patients and caregivers have, as well as the uh, uh, really uh, what is probably going to be a, a flood of uh, research and science that will start coming out uh, in the next few years. We are a volunteer committee uh, at this point, and uh, a lot of the challenges, uh, we've had disappointments from members of the public when you know, we, we don't have the resources to uh, send people over to the legislature to follow up on things. Um, we don't have the resources to, uh, in a large way, have experts come in, uh, tell us what is the current state of uh, thinking uh, from both medicine and caregiving, uh, uh, as well as the economics of uh, using cannabis uh, for medical care. Um, we don't have the funds to do a survey or have a website where we can get public input. And so I think that is for uh, oversight uh, to successfully uh, work uh, in an industry that's going to be uh, have a lot of money coming into it uh, because of the recreational side of things. I think it'll be hard to uh, challenging to do a good job at this without uh, the legislature creating uh, a body that is going to have the kind of terms and at least the kind of permanence, for instance, that the Cannabis Control Board will have, multi-year terms, uh, as well as some kind of 
uh, funding to both keep uh, the diverse group of experts and people we want on the board able to come and, and uh, uh, do the work we're asking them to do, um, but also fund some of the uh, surveying and uh, at the very least competitive research uh, we need to do to understand what uh, medical marijuana programs are looking like in the rest of the Northeast, the rest of the country, uh, and what is coming down the pike in the ways of therapeutic uh, science that we're going to have so that we can then in turn ad advise uh, the board on changes that need to be made in the legislation. And that stuff's all down the road. There's truly a lot of anxiety right now that the medical program will get in the, left in the dust of, of the money that's to be made in the recreational side of things. And it is understandable that the dispensaries are going to have hard choices to make about making a diverse selection of products that might not line up with what the most profitable products are going to be or the most popular in terms of uh, a public adult use marketplace. And, uh, you know, so that does really, again, speak to the need for a, a third party uh, oversight group to be involved in order to help uh, look at these things and, uh, you know, make sure that all sides are getting looked at. But um, before I go any further, do, do you, uh, does, are there any questions from, from the board? Jim, uh, you almost read my mind there. My first question, you know, having the chair and the former chair here was if we were going to kind of set aside a little bit of money for the uh, for the oversight committee, what would you do with it? And, uh, you know, that was a perfect response to the question that I hadn't posed yet. So that's that's great. I think that should absolutely be part of your recommendations. Um, to the to the board and ultimately to the legislature um and and keep in mind when you're thinking about the construction of the the committee um that it's pretty commonplace these days to offer per diems um to your members that might um you know not be able to kind of volunteer otherwise um volunteer their time so i think it's pretty typical to give 50 dollars per day um which is kind of a double-edged sword in a way because it allows people to participate but because there is this kind of appropriation that goes along with it sometimes the legislature um, needs to limit the number of meetings that you're entitled to um, but uh, just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about kind of who can participate um, Julie Kyle I've got a few questions but I'll, I'll turn it over to you first um I think I'm going to ask a question that's similar to a question I've asked throughout the day about patient education. Um, does your committee talk about patient education? And, you know, I wonder, you know, if somebody's, you know, uh, PCP agrees to fill out the forms and they go off and they go to a dispensary or they begin to grow, you know, what, what could be available for patient education? Because I understand that treatment works better if the patient understands the care that they're getting. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we do talk quite a bit about uh, education and communication to patients. And it's in, uh, you know, our reason for being that's written into the statute uh, that we be looking and reporting every year on, uh, you know, uh, what's being done in terms of communicating to patients and whatnot. But I would have to say it was in the original statute, it's really written from the point of view of public safety and of making sure that they understand what they're supposed to not do, uh, give it to somebody. Uh, you know, it, it was really about protecting the public. So those are things that we will obviously work on to recommend changing uh, in the charter of what an oversight committee would do. But we, we do talk about it because the group of us that are patients, uh, you know, you get a mixed experience of, of people that you speak to. Uh, it, certainly, I've never sensed any uniform training, uh, you know, uh, and, or anything resembling what would be a standard of care that would be the term provided uh, in a, a medical uh, organization and a standard of how to speak to patients. And when you get into something like growing, 
just the whole idea that patients aren't going to the registry because they can all of a sudden grow it themselves. I will tell you as, as somebody who's done it for several years and lives with a master gardener who's uh, done this her whole life and career gardening, it is not easy to do. And it is not easy to figure out how to do. And when you go to a garden center, they don't speak in English to explain to you how to do it. Um, and it's a, a terrible idea because you could end up with nothing. It could, in Vermont, it can be all killed by powdery mildew, the same as your tomatoes, uh, in one bad week. So nobody tells you that. Uh, and nobody, you know, I, I, I don't know. Nobody's showing me any numbers of why people are leaving uh, the, 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 as medical patients. But education is really difficult. And, and I thought, I think Kyle said it earlier, the idea of taking one of our uh, little gems in Vermont, like the Vermont uh, Tech School, uh, I was involved with them when we were, I was helping them start their flight uh, pilots program there. And there's expertise all over the state and elsewhere to bring into a school like Vermont Tech. And the idea of being, it's so exciting to hear everybody say this, be a leader uh, and perhaps Vermont show the way of how to uh, educate people to speak to their patients. It's m difficult enough for doctors and nurses to do every day. And we should expect a similar standard of care for patients uh, in the medical cannabis program. And quite frankly, right now, they're being spoken to by you know, lower wage uh, employees, most of them younger, some of them patients, but, you know, nobody with any uh, medical background, as far as I know, and nobody who would understand what medications I take that it might interact with, uh, you know, and uh, I think, you know, being able to provide oversight in that area and recommendations and research, how do we, you know, what would be uh, the best way to, uh, speak to people. I think in all industries, it's going to be needed in this new world of uh, recreational cannabis, because in the gardening industry, they need to learn how to talk to people growing cannabis. It's different and yet very similar to growing your, your fruits and vegetables. And right now, it's mostly people who are talking about growing it in their closet secretly. And when they speak to, you know, my 75-year-old uncle about how to grow a plant, he doesn't understand most of it. So standardized would be great. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, the uh, research and, and who is going to give this uh, education is, is a really tough question. So that uh, Stanford, for instance, published an article on what patients were using for their kids with epilepsy. And it turned out that those who were using stuff that had a little THC in it actually worked a lot better. I mean, they're all high CBD products. But that a little THC is actually a very good thing for controlling the epilepsy in the patients. But the research hasn't been done. And in the, in the rats, um, we know a lot of preclinical. That's the, the, the term you use for things that we don't know. But uh, mostly doctors have to listen to the patient. And uh, so doctors that listen to the patient are actually willing to fill out the paperwork and the doctors who don't. Uh, know that cannabis doesn't do anything for any of your symptoms and you're just a pothead looking for access. Um, so, yeah, you have to vet your, your doctor. <laughs> um, and the bud tenders are doing what they can. They, uh, you know, they get somebody says something works and they pass that word on. But that is, to me, totally uh, sloppy. Um, and I would much rather have tested products and the patients, you know, preferably reporting in some place where I'd have access to the data um, about what works for whatever symptoms they're dealing with and whether they take different things at different times of day and so on. And then you could begin to get a uh, spreadsheet or something for the doctors to be able to use who wanted to do the advising. And there are you know, lots of uh, doctors, I'm sure, who want to do that. Um, we don't have any pot doctors in Vermont, but uh, we have uh, other folks who are good for recommending things. Uh, but the research has to be done, and this is something we could do, and that's one of the reasons I'm really uh, eager to get us a website where patients can report in and a mandated testing program so we can trust uh, what they tell us. This is uh, Orange Blossom 3. We'll know exactly what terpenes and terpenoids are in that. 
Jim and, and Dr. McSherry, thank you so much for being here today. It's, it's really nice to meet you, at least in a virtual uh, setting. Um, I, 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 have a, I have a question. It's kind of building off of what you just mentioned, Dr. Uh, McSherry. You know, one of the things, well, a couple of things that you've, well, if I'm backing up, I'm really excited to help be a conduit for getting more data for the Symptom Oversight Committee to really uh, sink their teeth into a lot of this work, in addition to being a vehicle or a uh, megaphone, as, as Chairman Pepper uh, alluded to earlier, to make sure that some of your recommendations are not just another report that are lost at the State House, but actually breathe some life into, into this program and not let this program kind of be lost in the dust as we, you know, look to implement uh, um, an adult use side of the equation. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's sticking with me and we've heard, and it's no secret to anybody listening, is, you know, it's a very restrictive list on the types of physical ailments, mental ailments that, that qualify for the medical program. And I think really understanding how we can expand that list might help this medical program really not be lost um, as we look to do other things. So I was, I was curious, um, how the committee has kind of navigated um, suggesting changes to, you know, what is, uh, what symptom or what um, physical ailments, mental ailments um, are available for a healthcare provider to make a recommendation that that patient use cannabis. And then also, you know, what type of record needs to really be assembled in order for everybody to feel less anxious about expanding that list? What have other states done? I'm sure it's kind of like, and that's a, I'm sure that this answer could be an hour, an hour plus long, and I, and I understand that. And states are doing it differently, but if we wanted to expand the list to allow a, a healthcare provider to make a recommendation that's not as strict as, as it is now, you know, what type of research needs to be done? Well, yeah, the uh, kind of research that needs to be done, as far as I'm concerned, um, the if the patient says, I've been using you know, the stuff that my grandkid had in the closet, um, and it seems to really help with a symptom, I'm very eager to hear that and figure out what it does, uh, help with, that is. There are things like anxiety and pain where we have all kinds of mechanisms, uh, again, from rats, but also testimony from patients that it really helps with that. Uh, the idea of uh, alcohol's interaction with cannabis, a great public health question, because you certainly don't want to drink alcohol and then smoke pot and drive. Um, but using cannabis, you shouldn't smoke anything, by the way, uh, but using cannabis um, late in the day may actually counteract some of the bad effects of the alcohol that you've had also and improve your sleep. And your sleep is very important to making sure you don't get dementia, which older people care about. Um, because uh, that's when your brain cleans out the garbage that is built up all day. Every day you make a lot of new connections, but yeah, you don't need all of those, so you got to wash it out. And uh, people as they get older have uh, more difficulty with that. People who, and there's all sorts of good data, again, that uh, people who don't sleep on regular schedules and so on all get demented earlier. If you live near a freeway, you're going to get demented earlier than if you live further away. But you're not going to get Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis by living next to the freeway. You're going to get dementia because it keeps you awake at night or messes up your sleep. Um, so most of it, uh, I think, is listening to the patient. If the patient, uh, for instance, has a sleep sleep disorder, uh, they have COPD, the, the, they're having trouble breathing at night and, and uh, snoring and snorting and so on. Um, it helps with breathing, and maybe they have found that it helps with their breathing, and uh, you got to listen to them. And if they say that, then it's it's not going to be harmful for them to use it in a controlled sort of way. Um, it's just not as dangerous as uh, we might have thought uh, a few years ago. Dr. Joe, could I kind of put a finer point on that question, if you don't mind? Um, does it make sense for Vermont? I mean, the two ways that kind of the medical programs work around the country is one, you have a long list of statutorily defined uh, qualifying conditions. The other way is if a physician recommends it um, or if a, a doctor recommends it, you know, it doesn't matter what the condition is. It's their recommendation. Um, do you 
do you personally, um, not you know, as kind of former chair or member of the oversight committee, but do you personally think that we should go one, one way or the other in Vermont? Oh yeah, when I had patients who said that things worked for them, I uh, en encouraged that and endorsed it, and um, you know, tried to figure out which would have the best side effects for their other problems. Uh, I don't see any problem with the doctor who recommends that this is helping my patient. Um, letting that be a reason for that patient to take the cannabis. And if there's some doctor in the state who is recommending that everybody take it, then maybe they're just trying to get out of paying taxes. Um, but you know, once it's recreational, it's not a matter of really saving the, the human race from exposure to cannabis, um, except if you're under 21. Um, and I think doctors uh, who would be willing to fill out the paperwork in general can be trusted. And if they, again, the, the statistics show that there's somebody who's 90% of all the recommendations in the state, then maybe somebody needs to talk to them about <laughs> did they suggest <coughs> the patient or did the patient suggest it to them? Yeah. But if, no. If I could just add, go for it. Add to that, Dr. Joe. Uh, from the point of view of uh, of, of a patient, not a, not a, a medical practitioner, uh, you know, I think the list to a certain degree is is uh, protecting the doctor. Uh, the doctors are scared of of uh, marijuana. Uh, they are concerned about liability constantly. Uh, our state didn't make it friendly. We made it sound like it's dangerous, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, not that we need to look back at it, but doctors, just getting them to do the prescribing is, is difficult. So maybe adding in that it can be for a, a, these reasons as well as a discretionary reason would be a good idea. But in a bigger picture, one thing I might say is that cannabis exists at a weird nexus in healthcare. It is both in the realm of medicine and uh, being used in that way. It has been for thousands of years, but it's even being seen that way now, even in our country. But it's also, as we heard about naturopathic medicine and, and naturopaths being included, it's it's in that area of natural health care uh, that is more uh, done often in consultation with a patient and how things are working for them. But uh, <clears throat> It's, it's one of those things where you, we heard from the story this morning uh, w with the child who was being treated uh, for, for cancer uh, with high, extremely high doses of THC uh, to reduce the tumors. Um, we're in the Wild West still in terms of using cannabis in the, in the Eastern countries and the Western countries uh, as medicine. And uh, it's often being used, you know, it, like in that case, because it's been read on the internet that uh, there's a little study that's shown tumors reduce, but 10 families have said it really worked for them. And that's not a comfortable place for a lot of my doctors to have somebody who doesn't have MD behind their name saying, you know, look, it's worked well and I recommend it. So I think one of the things that we could do is foster uh, a different kind of environment uh, that is includes medicine, natural medicine, and opens the conversation up in a way uh, that a makes it clear we're past that uh, cannabis is a scary, dangerous uh, thing that it you know reefer madness showed it to be, and uh, that it's just like areas of medicine that exist now. Sometimes you have a desperate patient who will try anything, but Many times you just have creative practitioners looking to keep their patient out of the office, off of more dangerous pharmaceuticals, and living a healthier life. So I think some of it is, is, is not just giving them the science, but uh, turning down the level of fear and uh, you know uh, turning up the level of uh, what an amazing environment we're in, that we live in a state uh, that looks at everything in such a progressive way in medicine, we need to do it too here. Yeah, I, I would add that I sent uh, a new oncologist who came in uh, a bunch of articles showing that uh, 
brain cancer cells all get killed by CBD and THC, uh, but that didn't, you know, make any difference. Um, but knowing that, you know, certainly if I had brain cancer, I know how I'd be treating it. <laughs> and, you know, so it's not, all, it's not good human research, it's cell research, but at least there's a lot of free science that could come out. And I think that the patients are the ones who can really tell you and us what really helps uh, with their sleep disturbances or, you know, the multiple sclerosis patients were really big early on in getting this law passed in the first place um, because it helps with a lot of their symptoms uh, from the spasticity to the actually it, as an anti-inflammatory, it also uh, keeps them alive a lot longer because they have a, a problem of uh, inflammation as uh, the cause of their disease. So, yeah, no, I think you're uh, right on. Uh, let's, the, the legislature is not the right place for the laws to get written because um, people have to come and convince the lawyers and so on who live there that uh, this is good for them. Um, I think that the Cannabis Control Board can uh, keep the uh, Medical Cannabis Oversight Committee under control. So if we get too rambunctious or if they get too rambunctious, um, Opening it up to people, uh, you can say, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, at least we can make the case for why, um, again, dementia should be uh, one of the causes that you can actually use a drug which sometimes causes confusion. Well, well I you. appreciate, you know, let me just say one thing, which is to that last point, which when you're considering the makeup of uh, the board, the new oversight committee, sorry. Um, really, you know, be driven by that, which is kind of like, you know, if you give us the evidence, then we can we can write the regulations, you know, but we need everything we do to be backed um, by uh, science and data and be driven by um, kind of the voices of patients and caregivers and physicians. So, yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and, and apologies if it sounds, I can't tell if it sounds like I'm, if I'm yelling or not. I'm in this big empty conference room and I feel like I've got a yell for some reason. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Pepper, for drawing that finer point earlier. And then also well, what you just said, because that is really, really what I was getting at is if we're going to try and figure this practice not so to speak, what's the best path to go and how do we build a record that we can really stand on that, so that we're not just going and, you know, as Dr. Joe just said, getting a little too too wild with what we're trying to do, but make sure that it's grounded in, in something that, you know, everybody can at least respect the record that we've accumulated based off of anecdotal testimony or other studies that are out there or whatever the case may be. Agreed. Thank you. Any, <laughs> any other questions, uh, Julie or Kyle, for our witnesses? No, nope. nope. thank you both. I look forward to working with you. Um, Likewise from us. <laughs> we look forward to it. And please don't hesitate to reach out with uh, questions and, and comments uh, at any time, as, especially as we start working uh, on this recommendation. And, you know, as I said, our intention is uh, at these meetings, I'm sure we'll be uh, having input from uh, the public uh, as well uh, on both the future oversight committee and uh, current uh, situations that exist uh, that we'll be uh, passing along uh, for, you know, I, for your one, consideration. Yeah, one oversight on my part um, was that our, you know, we've been holding meetings on Thursdays, generally from 9.30 to 2, and I realize that that actually is the day that your committee usually holds meetings um, on Thursdays. Um, you know, I, I attended your last meeting. I thought it was incredibly informative from my perspective. I'd like to continue to attend them, but I hate to think that we're, um, you know, fighting for the same space, same time. Um, but anyway, that's just one side note, Jim. Maybe you and I can talk about that. Um, yeah. And, We'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. Th thank you both. We'll be in touch. Of course, we have an October or a November 1st uh, report back, so we can figure out kind of some sequencing offline a little bit later about how you all can get recommendations to us and we can kind of transmit those. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much.
Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having us and uh, for your uh, advocacy. We're looking forward to uh, working with you all. Thank you. Great. Um, the last thing on our agenda today is public comment. Um, I would like to just, before we move to that, um, one, thank all of our witnesses for today. Um, very powerful testimony, very um, helpful for us to um, remember just and put at the forefront of our work the importance of the medical program. Um, and I would just, on a programming note, like to mention or reiterate that uh, the board, the cannabis board, will not be meeting next week. We're taking um, the week off. It was getting a little bit difficult to schedule witnesses so close to the 4th of July holiday. Um, so our next board meeting um, will be the following week on July 8th. Um, but uh, any other um, thoughts, Julie or Kyle, before we move to public comment? Uh, you no. know, I, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody as well. We, we certainly are, are listening and hearing your recommendations and without getting into any specifics, you know, it, it's interesting from my perspective um, because a lot of a lot of the recommendations without getting too specific just seem like a logical progression of where the medical program should should go, recognizing not a lot of changes have been made. So um, that's just one of my general observations. I don't, I don't have anything else. Julie, any, any, I don't need to put you on the spot, but any uh, concluding thoughts before we move on? Uh, I, I have pages and pages of notes to distill, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the conversation. And for some folks who've spoken to us, they're really bearing some, some personal information, and that's to be recognized. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, our last thing on the agenda is public comment. Um, we're going to, again, start with people that have joined through uh, the link that on the video that can raise a virtual hand. We'll then move to people on the phone. Um, I'll let you know when that change happens. And I see our first um, public commenter on my list is Loretta Cragen. Hello. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate this time to talk with you. I also am on the oversight committee for medical marijuana for symptom relief, and I've been a medical marijuana patient for seven years. Um, I want to clarify a few things. First of all, by statute, there's only one meeting a year that this committee has to make. And there only the dispensaries are represented. There's no representation for any cultivators. The nurse that has been assigned by the governor has not shown up for the two years that I've been on the committee as a member. Um, and the only nurse participant that we've been having or medical participant other than Dr. Joe is Jesse Lynn Dolan. Now, um, so that gives us very limited time to hear from people and to express ourselves. Uh, generally, it's limited to a two hour meeting. And there's times when no public comment was ever on the agenda. I was an advocate for that um, in the two years that I've been there, and I'm the one that put that on the agenda. However, we've had very little public participation. Um, so since there's no caregiver designated, we haven't heard from a caregiver other than Jessie Lynn really talking to us about her needs as a caregiver, and that was enlightening to me. It's very enlightening to me, too, that um, dis the dispensaries have the ability to do whatever they want to do with this medical program. I am so, so grateful for you guys hearing from the patients and the cultivators. I truly, truly appreciate because I feel finally that my voice is being heard. Um, so um, even though the board is well-intentioned, we try, we've been very limited. So thank you for uh, giving us uh, this ability to have patients speak out, and I think only good things can become of it. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is Amelia. Hello. Um, I'll try to make it quick. I've got a couple points. Uh, the first is that, um, so rewinding a little bit, Jesse Lynn and I testify in GovOps, and there is a 13th spot on the advisory board that has been changed from the original intent to go to 
the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. So Jess and I went in there and we asked that that 13th spot be then reverted to a patient or healthcare professional nominated by ANAVT. The compromise that we got from our request was that uh, Representative Gannon proposed that we add a 14th member and that be somebody from the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. And that's how that happened. Um, I would propose, as Jess did earlier today, um, adding more medical professionals to that committee, including um, a nurse, a naturopath, she said a lab scientist. I would also like to add, we should ha have a pharmacist on that committee um, for expertise in drug interactions. Uh, and she also proposed, and I support adding a 15th member to the advisory board as a second member of that committee. I think that one of those members is already designated as the chair or chair appointee. I know that the chair is a patient and a caregiver, and I think that that's awesome. I do think that there should be a second representative from that committee who is specifically a healthcare professional. Um, so whether that be the doctor, the nurse, the naturopath, the pharmacist, however we restructure that board, I think that if the, um, if the chair of that committee is going to be on the advisory board or his designee is a patient, then somebody else from that committee who is a healthcare professional should also sit on the board. Um, so that was just uh, something that I noticed. Another thing I, I really just wanna bring up quick that I've heard from a couple of speakers today, and I, I, I don't wanna harp on it, but we cannot stigmatize the illicit growers currently in our state. Um, they aren't, a large majority of them, they are not dirty grows, they are not closet grows, they are clean, organic, living soil, integrated pest management with predator bugs, like, these are not dirty grows with harmful chemicals that are just going like that have products being pushed out into the public. Um, those things do exist, but they tend to come from people who are not growing product themselves, but are receiving product from other places in the country to then distribute and sell in the community. They are not from people who are growing within our community. Um, and I just wanted to make that point known because we have a lot of really talented, really clean growers in the state, and I don't want the misconception to be that the people who are currently growing illicitly are not doing so in a clean, organic, safe way. Thank you, Amelia. Um, next on my list is Tito. Hey there. Um, so um, now I want to talk about um, a problem that I've been dealing with actually for several years. Uh, first with uh, Senator Debbie Ingram um, and now Senator Chris Pearson. And um, uh, Senator Pearson suggested I talk to you about this now, uh, the board. And that is that um, a few years ago, the legislature enacted a vape tax, which was designed to curb the use of jewels in high schools, which I 100% agree with. I, I mean, I think, you know, nicotine is awful, but they used language so broad that anything that has the word vaporizer in it now has a 92% tax. And because of that, you know, there are some products like the Pax vaporizer, for example, that they are, these products are 100% intended for cannabis use. No one would ever smoke tobacco out of one of these things. And yet now, uh, PACs won't even sell to Vermont at all. We can't get it. We can't sell to our customers. Um, and even worse, the dispensaries can sell the exact same product without paying that 92% tax. And um, so it's just it's just two different rules for the same product. And let me tell you, in the burn gallery, we service a ton, a ton of medical patients, and we're talking about them, uh, talking about these issues with them all day long. Um, and uh, and uh, I just want to bring that to your attention. Hopefully we can just get some something changed in the words just to get an exemption for cannabis intended products. Um, I don't know, hopefully you guys can help me with this. Thanks, Tito. Thank you, guys. Virginia. Oh. Hi, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, one of the things is under the existing law, um, a healthcare professional in New Hampshire, 
Massachusetts, in New York, are allowed to uh, sign the form for a Vermont patient. Uh, and that was put in mainly because, <clears throat> you know, some Vermonters go to Dartmouth, some go to uh, Boston for their services, and then uh, in New York as well. So I just wanted to let you know that there are three states that we do allow. Um, and I also wanna bring up the caregivers and the fingerprinting. That was put into Act 164 when it was in the um, conference committee. And when I heard that that was being added, I immediately reached out to some legislators and said, why are you doing this? Because since this law went into effect in 2004, caregivers have never been fingerprinted. They do a background check on them, but never fingerprinted. And here we are, uh, you know, uh, putting another restriction on to uh, being able to get into this program. So I think that as it has been mentioned by others that uh, this is really a key piece that needs to, uh, needs to change. So again, thank you for uh, all your time. Thank you, Virginia. And thanks. Thank you, Virginia. Anyone else um, from the video link want to provide public comment? If you do, just raise your virtual hand. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have one person on the phone. If you'd like to provide public comment, please just hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, that was very helpful for me. Um, and I just would reiterate um, our gratitude to all of our witnesses today for bringing us up to speed, orienting us to what seems like years worth of advocacy. Um, and uh, hopefully we can um, use this opportunity that we're in right now to really think about um, how to refresh the medical program in Vermont. Um, Kyle, Julie, any any last thoughts before we adjourn? Thank you to all of everybody who provided testimony or public comment today. Um, like Julie said earlier, I took pages and pages of notes. I see a lot of recommendations that no matter who they came from, felt like they were on a similar, you know, strain. No, no pun intended, but um, we got a lot to work with and, and thank you for all of your advocacy and input. Yeah, I agree with, with yeah. what Kyle said, and I appreciate everybody's time and energy to put this meeting together and to take the time to spend uh, with us and sharing all this information with us. Yeah. Great. Well, um, all we have left is to adjourn, adjourn, so I'll take a motion if anyone would like to make one. Uh, I'll move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you all again, and... Uh, See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.